classrooms instruction and never show it to me, we're beginning to start to collaborate. And I think the possibilities for this expand beyond art and look towards possibly music, PE, health in the future. To me, that's extremely exciting. And it's about what we're about here, which is uh, trying to reinforce and to make uh, student learning impactful. So first we have Laura Burton, and before we get uh, started, I'd just like to give a huge thank you for my art teachers for coming out today and for being so passionate about this integration project. So round of applause for them. So Laura's going to just briefly describe an integration project that took place at the Hadley School, and um, I'll get up and kind of take a couple of these examples. Sure, whatever you like to do. For the audience at, at, home. at home, yeah. that's why the mic. Yeah. Yeah. If you could do the microphone. Use the microphone. You need to use a microphone. Um, so I brought artwork from a science art collaboration that I'm currently working on with Jane Flynn, who is the fifth grade. Um, science teacher at Hatherley. Uh, students were tasked with, um, it was part of their space unit, so students were tasked with um, creating a star pattern and a constellation and then a story to go along with it, um, or a legend. <laughs> so um, as you can see, we hit a bunch of um, science, social studies, history, visual arts, and um, we uh, worked um, independently at first, and in science they created uh, their star pattern, and they had to create the image to go along with it. And then in art class, we did um, some watercolor techniques, and they had to, um, what I asked them to do was depict a night sky or space. After that, they came to the art room and they had to transfer, sorry, they had to transfer this to their night sky painting, which uh, entailed um, mapping it out. So it was basically scale and um, placement. And it was multi-step, and they did a little sewing technique with it. And then once this was completed, they made a visual key to go along with it. And they did a writing piece in science class. So currently, right now, we are finishing up matting it um, and adding a title telling the um, season that you can see their constellation. And these will be on display at Hatherley School. So um, I just want to say it was like a great opportunity. Jane um, Flynn is so excited about collaborating all the time. And um, just really looking forward to more of these opportunities. So I brought some that I would like to show you. Some um, students actually collaborated together and their stories went along together and their constellations went along together. So I feel like um, what was great for the kids is that there was a, a hook for everyone. If you're the scientist or the artist or the history buff or the storyteller. And there was enough variety um, and there was voice and choice. There was enough movement. <coughs> Um, so it kept everybody engaged. So um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to do this, and um, I'm looking forward to more of them. So I would like for you to see some of them. Can I pass them? Up? Thank you, Laura. Next, we have Marissa from uh, Wampatuck to share a integration project that she was involved in. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marissa Donnelly, um, and the integration project that I am presenting um, 
was in conjunction with the second grade classroom teachers. Um, at the beginning of my project, or the student's project, um, I spent time in all of the classrooms during their writing workshops, um, and I saw how the classroom teachers um, taught a, a project about um, a small moment narrative. And the goal of the narrative was for students to take one small moment, something that happened to them, um, and to stretch um, their imaginations and use details to make the audience or whoever was reading their story be able to really feel like they were in uh, the student's shoes and to understand um, an emotion that that student felt during that time. Um, so for an example, I have um, Some, some kids did things where um, they felt really excited or happy. Um, so there was one story about a birthday party. Um, other kids did, I had another little girl, she did a story about a time she had um, an operation and her emotion was scared and nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and then after the students had written these narratives, um, they came into the art room with some of them actually had their word written on a piece of paper. And we talked about how artists, instead of using words to describe a small moment, um, use colors and different kinds of lines and forms um, to show emotions the same way that a writer would. Um, so all of the students in second grade did self-portraits. And um, they uh, looked in the mirror and were supposed to try to make on their face the expression from their small moment um, and draw it. So we did a couple practices. Um, they had to do some acting out to their neighbors to um, see um, what different emotions look like on different people and you know what happens to your eyes when you look surprised or what happens to your mouth when you look scared. Um, uh, and then we had been learning about the warm and cool colors prior to this unit. Um, so they had to decide whether their emotion was warm or cool. Um, and then they painted their portrait using their face and body had to be either warm or cool. And then they could pick either one for um, the background. So like this little girl used warm colors for her um, head, neck, and shoulders. And then she chose to also use warm for the background. Um, this little girl wrote a story about being surprised. I don't remember what it was about. Um, but she did cool colors. And then for the background, she used the opposite. So um, the students were allowed to, throughout their time in art class, um, they could stay at the same table if they wanted to stay with the same colors. But they did have an opportunity to move to a different table um, or take a look and see what other kids were doing or how, how other kids had on. Um, drawn their portraits or were painting them. So you could ask them if you want. Hello, I'm Tracy Duffy. Um, I've worked a lot with the fifth grade team at Jenkins Elementary School this year, um, and a lot with the science curriculum. So this fifth grade integration project we did was um, based on the water cycle. And we did a series of projects where I went into the classroom. I did most of this within the um, general classroom, not in the art room. And it started off um, with a experiment, um, and we drew the diagram, we labeled parts, we practiced labeling and um, different parts of their pictures before. And then after when we learned um, about more how the water cycle works together, we studied diagrams <clears throat> of the water cycle, and then we learned about all the different um, parts of a landscape, the basic components, so like foreground, middle ground, background, to draw our own accurate diagram of the water cycle. And then they had a vocabulary word bank of things like ridgeline, tributary, runoff, surface, um, flow. 
and they were required to accurately label and use arrows to show their understanding of the water cycle. And they were graded on how many vocabulary words they used correctly, how, um, you know, the arrows, the flow of it. And actually, it was really interesting to watch them um, use art as a means to show their understanding, because when they were doing the drawings, they actually understood, like, oh, it's evaporating, it's going up by using the arrows, and then the surface flow goes down by using the arrows. So actually using art as a way to kind of show their understanding and then understand it themselves. Um, that was really cool. So I brought um, a couple examples. Artwork um, I can pass around, and they came out really beautiful. We also added um, fun stuff like glitter and cotton balls and felt to make them more jazzy. So it was fun, um, and we've done a couple different um, science and art because it goes hand in hand. So it's been really fun to be able to go into the classroom and then also just observe what's going on in there in the room and then be a part of that. So and that's what we did. So I'll pass around the folder. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Alan Davis from the Cushion School. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us here. We're really excited about this integration opportunity. Um, I worked with a kindergarten, and I don't have any great artwork to show you. I'm fortunate that I even have a picture. Um, my gr crew works very quickly and puts things in backpacks faster than I can even <laughs> function. So those little leaf pictures went home uh, with trees and things sticking out of their backpacks, and I'm sure they were in a heap when they arrived. But I did run into a mother in the grocery store, and she thanked me for this project. And she said, and what I want to thank you most for was that you put on the back their authentic words so that I knew what to say to my child. This is a great picture of a three-headed dinosaur. <laughs> so um, the authentic words were a big hit with the parents. I went in, um, we read this book called The Leaf Man. I read half of it in art. The teacher read half of it during the art class. And we, um, I took the children outside. They collected some natural materials. We also, I brought in my husband. Thank you. Brought in big bags with me of all kinds of leaves, and we put them in a big circle. And we uh, made yarn circles and had the kids sort them all. Then they counted them. Then they did some graphing. Um, and we did a lot of um, playing with the materials. We picked up the materials, put them in different uh, directions. I showed them how to cut leaves. I showed them how to um, take the bark and scratch some of it off to make texture. So we played with the materials for the first um, probably 20 minutes. And then we talked about how they could glue them down to make anything they wanted. So this, I know you already know this, but I'll just reiterate. This is um, the picture, Jim, if you could go back to that. That is a um, mermaid who is swimming. And she has glittering hair. Those were the authentic words um, of the student. So you can see, I go in this class. And I'm very fortunate. Um, my teachers allow me, the kindergarten teachers allow me to go in every week. I run a station. So when it comes to something big that we have planned and I have planned, we work together. Um, we meet at lunch or whenever we have time. And we, um, I do half of it in her room, and then the, the kindergarten kids come into my room when we do the other piece of it. So it's a true integration. Uh, it's really a celebration also of the children and our youngest learners. Um, I know a lot of people think there's a lot of play in kindergarten. Not true. There's a lot of really hard work in kindergarten. Um, so this is an opportunity for the children to really tactily work with materials, play with materials, and explore uh, natural materials, as well as you may know this, but kindergarten has geometry and algebra standards, and we meet, I met nine of those, um, and I met all my visual arts standards as well. So it's a really exciting opportunity for us as art teachers, and I thank you all for giving us this opportunity. We hope to bring this forward um, whenever we can and however it works out. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm going to attempt to do over the next uh, remaining minutes is kind of give you a quick uh, overview of a few of the other initiatives that we've had, most of them at the elementary level. Um, our elementary instrumental program had an overhaul this past year in preparation for the 1920 year, um, where 
uh, we reinstituted the blitz model. So um, just to give you a quick idea of that, instead of 1.5 teachers, which had been the case two years ago, now we have three and a half teachers working together, <laughs> which is no small feat given the fact that some of them work in both Gates and the high school, so we had to figure out an overlay schedule to work for all of that. In the end, here are some of the outcomes that I think are particularly uh, noticeable. We went from five days, which had been the tradition, to four days, and that's uh, due to the uh, efficiency of the Blitz model. And most lesson days are done by 11.45 in our old model. Lessons and band took place the entire day. Um, of course, this requires a new type of sharing of staff, so to reciprocate, Susie De Silva, who in past years had been just at the elementary level, comes to Gates and helps out in that regard. Uh, general music. Um, one of our charges that uh, we've been working on is to create more opportunities for outreach for families. Um, and there's been a couple performances that you can see that grades K through 3 took place in the Hum Rock Holidays and the Holidays in the Harbor. In addition to that, the big one that we're focusing on is to provide weep videos, which go home to families and provides accessibility to all families to share in a performance. Um, on January 10th, the team and I will work on kind of calibrating that approach so that we're doing similar um, amounts of we productions per school. And I'm going to um, show you just a quick snippet, um, and I'll feel bad about cutting off on this, but know that you can go to the Pushing School and see the entire thing. So I'll give you about 20 seconds of this. This is a we production that Peter Munn piloted this year, and um, you can see you can do a tremendous amount here with this. Hopefully this isn't too loud, we did a test of this.
that self that relieves stress from them, to relieve stress from the directors at the, of the musicians at the elementary schools, to relieve stress from the middle schools. And, um, and where we were super successful, and we hope to continue that into the future. And some of the things that we plan to do are more service and more outreach because there's so much that music can do to impact other people. And um, helping the middle schools, helping the elementary schools, introducing them to this this world that they might not be introduced to early on. And um, one of the things we want to, we're looking forward to doing for the high school and for surrounding high schools is having a career, a, a workshop night where we host, um, I don't know, maybe college professors, um, voice teachers, conductors, of, of people who will put on workshops every uh, for like half hour workshops and, and teaching the, uh, the us students at the SHS how to do these things, maybe play an instrument, maybe even fix an instrument, maybe, maybe conduct, and also um, inviting other towns and, and connecting with the surrounding area because we are so niche here in Situate and it's important to interact with other, other people and see what they're, they're doing to uh, make their society better. And so Triumph is just one of those things that we, um, Mr. Thomas and I, Ms. Richter and I have all agreed that we want to make impact to everyone. And then, just to finish things up, here's a few pictures of our 2019 Winter Concert Series. The one in the uh, uh, right, <laughs> that, that's from the catwalk, and we had a uh, Mr. Gouchot up there, I know like heights. <laughs> and then, uh, as you can see, we have some select choir, mop up band, gate 78 band, family chorus. And thank you. It's so nice to be able to uh, present some of the exciting things that are taking place. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Thomas and art teachers. Um, one thing I, I thought of what, listening to all the collaboration is what a great example the, the kids are seeing, seeing adults collaborate, where traditionally it was you go to art, and what happens in art stays in art, but now it's <laughs> in, integrated into the classroom. So thank you. Anybody else want to say anything? No, no I th excuse me, I think it's great. Um, as a parent of a Wampatuck child, I've seen it firsthand, and I think it's fantastic. And also, I want to mention the tri -M. I, I wasn't sure what it was, but at the holiday concert, it ran so much more smoothly than in years past, and I wasn't sure why, but that's why. <laughs> because there were high school students there to help with the organization and all. So I want to thank you for that. It was really made a difference. He's actually <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Can you please? Again, just uh, thank you to our teachers, to Jim, to Duncan, who I know is in the middle of singing the Star Spangled Banner right now. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to share an update from the art department, the arts program. Well done. Thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda is the student representatives. Thank you. So um, we have a few things to cover because we haven't had a meeting since before winter break. So we're going to be talking about everything that's happened since our break. So one of the first things that we wanted to cover was a really cool field trip that anatomy classes at Situate High School took to a limited time exhibit at the Museum of Science in Boston called Body Worlds. Um, so I am a student in an anatomy class. And so I had this cool experience of going on this trip. And um, we knew about this trip a few months in advance uh, to going on it. And so Miss Last, our anatomy teacher, was really um, great in making sure we got through as many units as we could, progressing through the different systems of the body in the months leading up to this field trip. So we went through systems like the integumentary system with skin, the skeletal system, joints, so many different areas that really made the um, experience of going to see this exhibit that much more meaningful, to see the knowledge in the classroom 
classroom transferred to real life scenarios. Um, and so at Body Worlds, it consists of real human organs, bodies, and structures like blood vessels and nerves. Um, and these are all from people who donated their bodies to science. And these were preserved through a process we learned about called plastination. Um, the exhibit was also really cool in that it compared uh, these organs and structures of healthy individuals to those who lived their real lives with real diseases and injuries. Um, so it really uh, made things that you hear about often, like the impact of smoking. There was a healthy lung um, next to a lung of a smoker. And it just makes it that much more clear how much um, our actions can, in can affect so many systems of our bodies. Um, and also a cool thing was before and after the field trip, um, all of the anatomy classes took the time to have very open and honest discussions about the different ethics of um, these kinds of exhibits, um, the measures they take to respect these people, um, and also make so many connections to what we're learning in class to the real world. Um, and it was a really valuable experience to see, just see it, everything that you've learned on a PowerPoint or in a textbook displayed in front of you. Um, we also want to talk about the drama club and the fundraising they've been doing and auditions they've held. So they had auditions before break for their spring play, Dracula, which will be in May. Um, this is a very ambitious play that they're taking on. I believe it's around three hours. It has two intermissions. So this is a lot of work that they're putting into this, having their first rehearsal tonight. But I think it's going to be great. And then they also continued to fundraise over the break. They had a very successful uh, Christmas tree pickup service that they organized. And um, so students uh, went in teams to pick up uh, trees from the holidays all over Situate. Uh, this past weekend alone, they actually had over 100 trees to pick up. They spent six hours each day this weekend picking up trees. So that's incredible. Congratulations to them for that successful event. And uh, the Performing Arts Department was also spreading some Christmas cheer with some caroling before the holidays. Um, the Select Choir and Chorale went to the town hall with a small field trip, and they were able to perform a few songs that they had been rehearsing and some classic holiday songs, and it just added a nice magical spirit. And um, the Drama Club also did their highly anticipated annual caroling at Derby Street, um, which is always such a fun event, and it had a great turnout. Alrighty, so our fourth item is the DECA field trip. So the competition was held at the Seacrest Hotel in Falmouth, Mass, uh, with students participating in business classes at Situate High School to leaving to attend on December 12th. And there was a great representation of Situate students at this uh, business competition, which centered around areas such as marketing and finance and involved both in written interactive role play components to apply skills learned in class to real world scenarios. Uh, there were many any successes at this competition. Some students will have the opportunity to move on into the state competition, and we want to congratulate all who attended. Yay, Situate High School. Yay, DECA. Uh, we had Spirit Week the week before Christmas break and holiday break, and this was to show school spirit, and we wore outfits of various themes, such as ugly sweaters, hats, pajamas, and all white with like silver glitter because snowflakes and like snow, and it's beautiful. I want it to snow. Side note. Yeah. <laughs> and we also had an in-school winter concert at the end of our week before winter break. And we played classics such as Sleigh Ride and All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. And on December 4th, we probably should have put this right before the DECA event, there was a debate that Situate High School attended at Old Rochester Regional High School. Yay. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the field trip. So do kids not dissect animals to see <laughs> that they used to, <laughs> like they used to? We, um, we do uh, have some dissections coming up, and we've done some already. Um, but this, but obviously, no human cadavers. <laughs> so, so this field trip really just um, was really helpful in learning about human anatomy, like applying what we like even dissect in the animals to on a human scale, like what that would look like. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, next up on the agenda is the acceptance of the minutes. December 9th minutes. Um, yes. Does anybody, any, any, 
Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Yes, you have to. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions about the minutes? No? no. Do I hear a motion? Uh, move to accept the school committee min minutes from December 9th, 2019. Is there a second? Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And next up is the leadership report. Thank you very much. I know we've had a lot of presentations about what's been going on with the situate experience, uh, so I'll be brief tonight. Uh, just that we've had a lot of time between our last couple of meetings and a lot of good things we wanted to share. Uh, first up is, um, uh, is a project that you may remember from last year, actually. Um, so our fifth grade students uh, read this book called A Long Walk to Water, and uh, our Jenkins kiddos, along with their, their staff, have been collecting donations for South Sudan, which is um, a key uh, geographic region of the book. And they're just right there in the process of finishing up their donations, and we'll be sending them out to South Sudan, um, a contact we have out in South Sudan. So kudos to them both for the, the interesting work they're doing in the reading and the, the, liter the literacy, but also an opportunity for community service for our, some of our youngest students. Um, I want to thank actually Dr. McGuire and Mr. Wargo um, uh, particularly, but also the entire high school staff. We were able to host a poet and dean of students over at Brandeis University, Jamil Adams. Um, he's well known in the area for leading workshops and conversations around diversity uh, and around race. And so he brought a really interesting workshop to uh, our team, to our staff, to some of our students as well, uh, a message of you know, love, inclusion, and trust, ultimately. Uh, we're hopeful that this is uh, the first step in a larger um, set of workshops and larger conversation to have around race, around inclusion, around diversity for our schools and, and for our high school in particular. You see there are sports marketing class over at Gillette. Uh, each year this class has a culminating experience where they pitch their project, their marketing project, to actual sports executives. Uh, you may remember last year they were with the Celtics. This year they were out at, uh, at Gillette. And while I'm sure we're all disappointed about the Patriots' performance this weekend, I think it's still a really cool opportunity for our students to be able to get that real world experience and uh, that authentic audience for their project. You just heard a little bit about DECA. I won't spend more than just a second or two on it. We have 24 Situate High School students who have qualified for the state competition in February, so you hear more about them in the coming weeks. You also saw a little bit about our performances. Picture there, we just have a symphonic band. I want to take a moment to uh, thank our, our guidance team uh, in general, but in particular one of our new high school counselors, Ms. Kamini. Uh, she developed this presentation for parents and caregivers for all of our ninth grade students, just to introduce them to our school counseling programs and to some of the services that are offered. It's a nice way to help families transition from middle school to high school, and there's a lot of important information as kids begin their journey in high school. So many thanks to her and, and to our entire guidance team for that. An interesting uh, collaborative project uh, at the Gates that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this blend of maybe arts and history. Uh, what you see here are some students that are in the process of making their own um, Maori artwork. And uh, what happened was students uh, had some time to be able to learn a little bit about the history of uh, Maori culture. And um, then we had the South Shore Art Center come down, talk with them more about that culture, talk with them more about the symbols of the Maori of um, New Zealand and that region in the world in general, and then ultimately students got to develop their own artwork from uh, wooden soap carvings, which is pretty neat. You heard a little about art integration, these opportunities, um, organic opportunities where we can find the blend between art and science, or art and history, or English. Uh, and you heard a little bit from Ms. Burton about her collaboration with Ms. Flynn and their work on uh, constellations and on astronomy in general. One of my favorite programs, uh, again, that our guidance department runs, we bring in our uh, graduates, our recent Situate High School graduates, to talk to current juniors and seniors and just share experiences uh, from their first few months as recent Situate graduates. They shared a little bit about the college application process to first, you know, what it's like to be a little bit more independent now that they uh, are out of high school and, and pursuing uh, many of them degrees and undergraduate programs around, around the country. 
Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to take this moment uh, to recognize and to uh, officially announce the appointment of Dr. Lisa McGuire as our interim high school principal. Um, we're really excited to be bringing on Ms. McGuire. Obviously, really sad to be losing Mr. Wargo, who earned a position as an assistant superintendent over in Weymouth. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. McGuire will be starting officially on the 27th of January. So over the next few weeks, myself, uh, Dr. McGuire, Mr. Wargo will be taking some time to do transition work and help prepare her to be taking over for, for high school principal effective at the end of the month. Uh, while I'm sure many of you know uh, Ms. McGuire just from her work as the assistant principal, I shared with you a little bit about her background in some of your backup as well. Uh, bachelor's degree in English and History over in Stonehill, uh, master's uh, at UMass Boston, and then the PhD over at Northeastern in Educational Leadership. Dr. McGuire knows our kids, she knows our families, she knows our school community, uh, and she has great expertise to bring to the role and to the work. Uh, Later today, uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll do our executive session to approve final um, budget for, um, for contract. And assuming that uh, the committee votes that, we'll the post for an interim assistant principal position that will be taking over from Ms. McGuire for the next few months. You know, there was a lot of information in a, a short period of time. Before we have any questions you know, regarding anything here, uh, any questions, comments for Dr. McGuire? Uh, no, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm very happy to hear, hear that you're going to be leading the high school through the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. <laughs> you, you could like it. I'd just like to say that it's an honor to be able to serve the Situate Public Schools in this new capacity, and I'm really excited to continue working with staff, students, and families in the community in this new role. Thank you. Well said. Very good. All set. Uh, next up is the presentation of the high school program of studies. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Rundle.
students earning honors credit um, will do independent um, work, completing additional work outside of the classroom. As you know, last year we added the senior selectives option for um, students to have the opportunity to take honors senior selectives or a college prep level senior selectives, and they found it to be very successful. They would like to. Um, bring that down to the other four grades. And Mr. Scopoletis here, I don't know if you have anything to add you want to add to that. Um, how'd I do? I think you, you nailed it. Um, if there's any questions at the end or at any point, I'm happy to take those. Okay. Um, just moving on. Uh, there are no changes in family and consumer science. There are a number of changes in fine and performing arts classes. And it's basically we've um, added a few classes. We've added a portfolio art class, which is a full year class that will run concurrently with the AP Studio Art class. Those are for students who want to, who may have finished their AP Studio Art exam portfolio, but want to continue to develop a portfolio the next year without having to take the exam. And we have created three class codes for each of the AP Art exams. We have uh, AP exams in drawing, 2D art and 3D art, um, and we've never um, distinguished those three exams on our transcript, even though the students take each of those, one of those exams. So next year, in the, on the student's transcript, it will tell uh, the colleges exactly what exam they will take, um, which I think is a really important piece. The other uh, piece that we are doing is we are reinstating the graphic design and yearbook production class as a four-year credit course. Last year it ran as a two-credit course and as, as an independent study for the second half of the year. Um, and then there was an art flow chart that we removed from the program of studies. And Mr. Thomas is here tonight, so he can speak to that as well if you have questions at the end. Um, no changes in health and physical education or history or social studies. There are some changes with respect to the math sequence. Uh, next year, all ninth graders will take either college prep or honors geometry instead of honors and so, instead of algebra one or algebra two. Um, and students in the class um, for the class of so in the following year, the students will then take algebra one or algebra two. The other um, the other um, piece that we added is we are combining the advanced algebra and the trigonometry class. In the past, they were two separate um, uh, uh, semesterized courses, and we're making them one course next year. So there will be a course called Advanced Algebra and Trigonometry, and there'll also be a course called Statistics and Probability. Again, probability and statistics used to be semesterized courses. They're just combining them to be full-year courses, which they were a number of years ago. And Liz is here tonight, so if she has any questions about the sequencing, she can answer those as well. Um, she also, they also removed a low interest class. Uh, there's an elective called C++ Programming. Again, we haven't run that course for a number of years, so we've decided to remove it from the program of studies for next year. In terms of science, we've just made some changes to the descriptions of our uh, courses and also changes in prerequisites, especially for chemistry and physics to reflect the math changes that are happening in our program of studies for next year. There are a number of changes with respect to our science, engineering, and technology education. We are um, replacing our intro to engineering design with engineering one, and we are replacing our engineering principles class with engineering two. We have updated the descriptions for our Robotics 1 and Robotics 2 classes. And we've also replaced our CAD 1, our CAD 2, which is Computer Aided Design 1 and 2, in our architecture classes with one course called Fundamentals of Technology Drawing, CAD, and Manufacturing Practice. So those three courses will be uh, streamlined into one course. Uh, the, it was an update to the description of the engineering capstone, and um, they reorganized the prerequisites to allow students to enter the program with engineering one, robotics, or technical drawing, to make it more easy for students to access the higher level engineering courses. 
Um, for special education, we did add, um, we did create, um, we did change some of the language, the course description, and the course titles for some of the classes in our IXL program to be more reflective of what the students are doing in the classroom. Um, and as for War of Languages, this is our last one. For War of Languages, we replaced the French 4 and 5 culture through film with the French 4 and 5 francophonial, which is what we've done every year, we kind of flip every other year. Um, and again, the Spanish 4 and 5 culture through film with the Spanish 4 and 5 bundo, 21. We're also offering, um, we also added two additional courses to the World Language Program. One is called Introduction to Ancient Greek, and the other one is Ancient Ideas. They eliminated the prerequisites in all the courses except for the advanced placement courses, and increased the prerequisite in advanced placement, and then there was just additional language about level changes. That's a lot. Um, but I have um, five of the department chairs here tonight. If anyone has any specific questions about the program of studies, I'm sure you guys have a few. So. I'll start. I'll start. <laughs> um, I have a question about the prerequisite changes to the uh, in the world languages accepted advanced placement. Could you ex clarify? It's just to record the the response. That's all. Um, so. We've been tracking um, data from the ad drop period each year, and um, despite uh, sort of tightening up the language around prerequisites, we're still identifying a lot of movement in classes um, within the first four weeks of school, which can be quite disruptive to the learning environment for both the student and the teacher. So we've been having conversations about this for several years, and we decided at the end of the day that the teachers are really the ones that know the curriculum best, and they're really the ones that know the students the best. And they are really in the best position to make recommendations about what courses are most appropriate for our students. So um, we this year have decided that we're going to sort of change our procedure around making recommendations. We're going to eliminate the number grade. We don't feel like it is a good reflection of um, so much of what goes into the idea of recommending our students. So it, it's a number grade, but it doesn't talk to us about a student's um, skill level in each of the four language domains, so speaking, listening, reading, and writing. It doesn't give us information about a student's um, sort of strengths and needs in a classroom, and it doesn't tell us anything about their interests. Um, and as you can see, we're trying to expand our programming to attract um, different interests. So we think that teachers should be having individual conversations with each and every student who's deciding to continue on the progression of world language learning, talk with them about um, their strengths, their needs, their weaknesses, uh, their interests, and use those conversations as a means to determine what level is most appropriate for students. I'll give you one quick example to sort of um, help you understand why we're moving in this direction. We're noticing a lot of movement from our juniors. Um, so at our junior level, you can take a CP elective for example, film, or you can take the honors track. And we're finding that there's a lot of movement in those classes because our honors level class has a great deal of independent reading. And so a student can have a solid B plus or A minus in their sophomore year course, be recommended for honors, and struggle with that reading piece. And that really can, can um, bring their, their grade down or their GPA down. So it's much more um, valuable, we think, for the teacher to say, hey, listen, I know the curriculum in the honors class for junior year. I know you're going to be doing a heavy amount of reading. I know that's an area you struggle in in the world language classroom. So why don't we consider the CP class for you? And vice versa. Knowing that we have a student that's really strong in reading, we might say, you, you know, the film class might not be for you. You might actually um, thrive in the honors level course. So we're going to take a different approach and track data for a few years and see if uh, conversations among teachers and students aren't better um, in determining appropriate levels for students rather than that, um, say, B plus or A minus. We didn't want to remove them entirely from the AP course just because of the rigor associated associated with that course, um, we felt like that still needed a grade associated with it. But I could see, if, if we find this to be successful, I could see us eliminating prerequisites across the board. Thank you. We don't leave. 
Dead. Um, I'm just curious, uh, if we're adding two sections. Um, number one, what if we don't get the enrollment that we need and how are you able to staff those? So good question and Principal Wargo and I had a wonderful conversation about this. So yes, there's a huge budget piece to adding to our current Latin staffing. Um, but we decided that there's no harm in putting these courses into the program of studies, uh, advertising them to the student population and seeing if there's interest. Um, so a couple things do need to fall into place. We need the budgeting to come in. We need the student interest piece to come in. But um, I think um, in allowing students the opportunity to explore this course or these course offerings, um, we may be able to take a look at um, current programming and make adjustments based on um, what the students are saying they want to take for courses. So should we not get the funding, this, you know, this may be something we can continue to explore in the future. Um, really what we're trying to do is capitalize on um, the skill sets of our current teaching staff and um, meet the needs of those students. We're really looking for ways beyond just traditional world language learning to, to attract students. So that Ancient Ideas course won't be much about syntax and verb conjugations and vocabulary development. It'll be a lot about um, learning from past cultures and, um, and talking about how some things never change, really, and so some fruitful discussion among students. Great. Okay. But we really would love to see it come through on the budget. No, I'm, I'm very operational. I like, <laughs> I like to see the process, which leads me to my next question, which isn't necessarily for you. Oh. It's um, how is... And I probably asked the same question last year, but how does this whole process of reviewing the program of studies take place? Like, what actually happens? Is there one meeting in November that says this is what we're going to do, or is it kind of an ongoing thing within each department? Uh, ongoing discussions. Um, we meet regularly to determine. They meet with the department chairs meet with their uh, departments and teachers to determine what they want to run, and then it, um, it's vetted through uh, administration, and it comes to you as the, um, the, the rubber stamp. Um, and then what we do is we open it up to the students. Uh, first of all, we open it up to the teachers to make recommendations in terms of leveling for those students who need um, certain classes for graduation. So they put those requests in our Aspen program, and then our students will go in and choose the courses that they would like to take. And then the department chairs take a look at how many sections they can run, and they take a look at the, um, the budget and the, the staffing, and that's how the decisions are made. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, I don't think it does. Yeah, that's, I think that was specific to Ms. Shula's comment, but just in general, I was curious, like, how did, um, science determine how did they come to this solution or how they come to these these um, recommendations or how did math come to these recommendations um, and I think leads to my last question is did I hear that algebra is being moved from ninth to tenth grade so I'd be curious as to why why that you no know, algebra is going from ninth to tenth correct I'm bringing my notes um. Hi, good question. So I'll kind of answer two questions at the same time. More, okay. it sounds like process-wise. Yeah, process. Um, so about, I'm going to say about 10 years ago, um, well, probably a little bit more than geometry was put into 10th grade. Um, I can, everybody can guess. Does everybody wonder why geometry moved to 10th grade? MCAS, right? So MCAS comes along. We've been doing decent on MCAS, fine. Um, we deliver in our middle school curriculum um, in math. The, we use the 2017 standards, so um, we've updated those. And one of the things that the standards deliver are a lot more um, content for geometry in seventh grade. So we took some of the things that we're teaching currently, or have been currently teaching in 10th grade geometry to our kids. They've already seen them in seventh grade. Again, exposed to them, not maybe necessarily mastered them. The other piece is now that we've had MCAS 2.0 and our, we've had scores across the district, we also recognize that um, 
less than 25% of that test has geometry on it. So we put all of our sophomores into a class of geometry that's not necessarily algebra based. So for our kids, for continuity, we give them eighth grade standards and some of algebra one in eighth grade. And then currently we give them algebra one or algebra two based on a recommendation or a prerequisite. Then they go to geometry. And then we put them in pre-calculus or algebra two. We're recognizing that we're not giving kids a really solid foundation um, because there's kind of call it like a gap here, right? We deliver a geometry curriculum that they don't get all the algebra that they can. They're less mature when they're a freshman. Some of our kids master algebra two honors, absolutely. They take their off year of honors geometry that has some algebra in it, but it, we really don't give kids the best opportunity, so we want to help kids develop that. As far as process with regards to this timeline, um, I've been the math department chair for um, this is my four, fourth or fifth year. Um, we've been having these conversations. Like I feel like the first conversation I had with the department that's been here for a long time is, okay, when are we switching geometry? So we've been having this conversation because we recognize these gaps. Um, you can take a look at our M MCAS scores. They're not awful. However, we could definitely do better. And we think that, again, this is not, it's one of the pieces, but we are kind of waiting, saying like, look, if we're going to make this change similar to any other change we make, we need some time for it to settle. We need to do it for four years for a cycle of kids and we wanted to get some feedback on our new MCAS and recognize like okay are we going to harm kids if we do this or hinder them um, and we felt like using some of the data and like I have some data from surrounding towns who do we're again not we're not doing it wrong but a lot of our surrounding towns who have different and I see some head nods different or better MCAS scores um, have a, the they t deliver grade 8 and algebra 1 and then they do that they do the geometry in freshman year so that's what we're using um, what else did I miss? Um, we wanted to make sure that our Algebra 2 is really Algebra 2, our pre-calc is re really pre-calc. Um, it will give us an opportunity to strengthen both the pre-calculus and the geometry. Um, continuity without a gap. What else did I miss? I think I got most of this. And I wonder if that answers your question. No, it's great. Okay. Any other? Sorry, I just want to make sure I heard that right. Like you said, yeah, no. No, I'm glad you asked for clarification. Any other math questions? I can get up and sit back down, but. <laughs> A fifth grade math question? OK. We'll all do it together because we can all do math. OK. Thanks. <laughs> Ms. Reynolds, I just had a question about the classes that are removed. Are these kept on a list somewhere that students can go back and look at down the road? Or are they just removed from the program of studies and just, I guess, forgotten about, for lack of a better way of putting it? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? So for the the classes that are taken out because there's no interest, what happens to those classes? Do they, like, is it something a student could pick up three years from now? Or is it something that's just removed com completely from the school? Um, it really depends on what the department, departments really want to do. Um, for example, we haven't run our, um, um, our accounting class for a number of years, but are we have, we want, there are certain classes that the, the department chairs really want to be able to keep in program of studies based on what the needs of the students are right now. Um, like for example, a few years ago we had um, business apps and everything Google. Well, not everyone knows Google, so we cut, we removed that class because we didn't feel like it was necessary. Or um, maybe the department chairs might be able to answer that question a little bit better. I might jump in just quickly. So if, uh, let me give you an example. If a class is removed, but other students already taken that class, that's still in our system and all the credits are still in our system. And the class itself, even if it's not currently being offered, remains in the background. So that if in the future it needs to be brought back to the forefront, it can be brought back to the forefront. There's some like behind the scenes here that every class is essentially coded. And it's coded both here in situate public schools and connected to the state system. So that students who get that credit are reported to DESE ultimately. And so a class that is not being offered in 2020, 2021, it may be offered four years from now, it can still be brought back from the archive of the system, and it can still be edited if necessary, or it can be brought back as is. Okay, that's his question. I have another question. And then I have a, a two-part question. I, I really like the idea of this mixed honors in the English um, and getting rid of some of the prerequisites in the world language. So it's probably a two-part question. Um, when this is done by a, a department, is it something that's shared across the board, or is it something that World Language brought to forward and uh, uh, science might not have seen until the program of studies is, is brought forward? 
We, as, depart as department chairs, have continuing conversations about change or any changes that we're having with, with, any, um, with, any, with any one of our classes or our curriculum. Um, so we are all, always in touch with you know, any changes that they are coming up with, say, science, you know, Mr. Scopoletti is aware. So we are very aware of the, of the changes within our department, within the department's chairs. Okay, no, that, that's what I figured. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. And then in terms of the mixed honors uh, for English, I guess it's a question for you. Um, is this something that a, a student could go from like a CP level up to honors midway through the year? Or is this something that however you start the year, it would be how you end the year? No, it's, it's a good question. And it, it, a switch from CP to honors or honors to CP would still fall within the same um, ad drop deadline that exists for any other course. So you can, it wouldn't be a situation where you go through and you, know, you only have like two weeks left, kind of where we're at now, and like, oh, wait, I want to drop down from the honors because I'm not doing that great with my, my honors work there. So it would still follow the same deadlines that are already in the program. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That was one of my questions too, but I just had an MCAS question. So the current, the competency determination, all the, how they're rated, the, the scores, that's the new scores, that, the rating scales that we've already received. Are they changing it again is my question, or it's? <laughs> in terms of, um, I, in terms of what the competency determination is, um, it is, um, Basically, students that haven't met with proficiency on the MCAS, uh, ELA, or math have to have a, uh, what they call an educational proficiency plan mm -hmm. to graduate. Um, and what we do is we um, take a look at those students and our department chairs take a look at what courses they will need to fulfill senior year to meet that requirement. So it's just a matter of the language and the, and the scoring before it was needs improvement um, or um, unsatisfactory, I think, and now it's partially okay. meeting expectations. And meeting okay, that was my question. So it's just the language. Yeah. Okay, change. thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you. Well, it's, it's, I know, it is time for comments, statements, and questions, but I figured we'd start off with any questions about the the changes. So, uh, Jen O'Neill, piano so Jen. I have, I have a question about the, um, the language program, the 4-5 program. That's a CP level course, but any senior who's already taken honors up through 11th grade then has to drop down to CP. Will they be able to do the same thing they're doing in the English classes and do a mixed honors CP because otherwise you only have the option of CP or AP, which is something I fought hard to get for seniors in English, and now I guess the whole school's gonna have it. So there are a select few students that would like to do something like this, but not enough to substantiate a curriculum change and a program of studies change. But each and every year, we survey the students, whether it be put your hand, your heads on your desk, you know, if, if this, if you could take a honors course as a senior, would you? Or whether it's a formal Google form from the teachers, um, we keep hearing the buzz, so we revisit it every year. But the numbers just aren't there to substantiate this quite yet in world language. It's different in a four-year graduation requirement or a two-year graduation requirement. So um, although about, depending on the year, a third to maybe 50% of our students take world language in that fourth year, I think that's why we don't have the numbers and the need we were seeing in English. We are open to it. Could, could seniors on an individual basis take it as an honors level course working with the teacher? That's a sticky situation. That's a G, it's all about the GPA. Well, it, yes, it is. And it, and, it, and it maybe shouldn't be, and that's a whole other thing. Um, but um, that's a sticky situation because of contracts and preps and things like that. Um, you know, that does require a substantial amount of work from the teacher. So if there were the numbers there, um, we moved away from that because we were running classes of, say, like six senior honors kids. We have an AP option for that if they really want to accelerate their learning. And then we have a really cool CP option for them as well. Um, so we continue to explore this. We'll continue to. 
to, we are we are open to continuing to explore this. And should the numbers be there, um, we would be happy to follow in the footsteps of the push. Can you just turn it into an honors level course, and then they would get the 4.5 if they got the A? We've talked about that, but philosophically, we believe that there is sort of on-level learning, and then there's advanced learning, and that's the AP class. So, like, what is the honors? It's like it, it, it's like a it's like a CP square. I mean, what is it at the end of the day? They're either learning on level or they're learning. But there are some students who take honors from 9 through 11 and just aren't ready for that jump to AP, but really when a college is looking at their transcript, it says honors for three years and then CP. Does that tell the college that they're going to slack senior year or does that tell the college that, you know, that's the only class available? So we, we think that it tells the college that these kids are really dedicated to a world language and they're taking it four years and we think that that's a, that's a lot, that's a, a strong message. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very competitive world language program. We have high numbers. So students taking level four, whatever, CP, AP honors, they're standing out among um, other applicants to, to universities and colleges. Um, we've talked about this with um, uh, colleges. And we, we've talked about what does that look like on a transcript. And, um, there has yet to be a really solid argument um, for offering that CP honors and AP level um, in the world department. And I wish you had intro to Greek last year. <laughs> Not me, for somebody else. <laughs> and also kudos to the math department. I think that's an amazing change that is really going to help students. I've had two students that did that gap year of geometry and then tried to do pre-calculus and it to struggle the first couple of weeks. So kudos. <laughs> Oh, and one more, one more thing. I just wanted to let everyone know that Shore funded the anatomy trip with a grant. So. <laughs> Thank you to Shore. <laughs> Are there any other comments, questions, or statements from the public? No? Okay, moving on. Um, we have old business. The transfer of the memorial sign for Joe Gibbons Way. Good. As I'm pulling this up, I just want to say thank you to Tammy and the team for all the effort they put into uh, the, the, course, the course studies handbook today. Oh, oh, there we go. Sorry. There's a delay. I'm not going to. So what I have in front of you here is um, a follow-up to a conversation that we had at our last meeting um, where we brought to the committee a recommendation to move a sign that's currently at the old Gates Middle School, excuse me, <coughs> and move it here to the new middle school. Uh, the, Gates, uh, yeah, the Gates Middle School um, has a sign that's officially the J.J. Gibbons Way, but it's for uh, Joseph Gibbons, a longtime member of the SPS family and principal of the middle school. We talked as a, a group about what that would look like, and what I have for you here is the formal presentation of it. Uh, it'd be the recommendation of the Citroen Public Schools to officially transfer that sign from our old middle school campus to the new middle school. There'd be a couple of steps that the committee would need to take. We talked a little bit about some policies, <coughs> excuse me, that you already have in place. Um, one in particular regarding memorials that would have to be temporarily suspended to be able to move forward with this transfer. That said, what you see in front of you would be the placement of uh, that sign. Again, the transfer of it from the old campus to its current, uh, its new place there. Um, because it's not an official street here in Situate, it would be within the campus of Situate Public Schools. The action would really only be here with the school department, and then ultimately the DPW, if approved, would be able to move the sign over. I shared this also with you last time, which was just some correspondence from Joseph Gibbons, um, Joe Gibbons' son, who's here today in the audience. I don't know if you want to say a few words at all, Joe, um, but this is the, the presentation here in front of the committee. Joe? <coughs> I'd like to thank Peter and the committee for uh, fast-tracking this. Um, a prior school committee 15 years ago um, voted to um, commemorate um, my dad's service to the uh, Situate Public School System by placing the um, sign in, in front of the uh, former Situate Junior High the, and the Gates Intermediate School on First Parish Road. Um, 
after having some conversations with Peter at a, when we served on another committee, um, we both came to the uh, understanding that with all the construction that's going to be going on up at the um, Old Gates property and its conversion to a senior center, which didn't have any connection um, to my dad's service in public education, we both felt that, it, it, and my I'm speaking on behalf of my brother and my family, that it, it would be better served to have the sign um, in, in front of the new school. Um, my dad was a um, ardent supporter of education. He came to Situate in 1954, taught at Situate High School till 1967 and was the principal of the Situate Junior High from 1968 until his retirement in 1990. Um, and during that time, um, he served a lot of, um, and gave a lot to the town of Situate, and um, we feel that it would be more apropos to have the sign in front of um, the new school than up in front of a senior center. Well said. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, as a former student of the Lester J. Gates Junior High, when your dad was there, you know, I'm happy that we can do this for him. Um, okay, anybody have any other comments about this? I just have a, and I'm, I will defer to the DPW. I just noticed the, the placement of this street sign. I'm not gonna say that I'm an expert in placement of signs. I'm just not sure why it's there. But if that's where they want it and that's where it can go, then that, that, that's fine. Yeah, the, the placement of it is really on the loop road, ultimately. So it would be that access road that connects the, the gate school to the larger access road, which goes around the entire campus. Uh, it's the only road that's officially the, the Gates Middle School road, whereas everything else is shared with the high school, that larger access I road. You. I guess if I could continue this up through the old Google Maps, okay. would come back here through where the construction is happening right now and come back to, to the so high school. So it's just that loop there, the left side. This is the loop that okay. Next to the middle school is the only road that is what I'm going to say like the middle school's okay. road, sort of air quotes okay. around that. Okay. Can I ask one question? Um, where is the sign um, that has the Lester J. Gates uh, school? Where would that be on this? That's, that's right here, right? So when 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 folks walk in and then yeah, it's on the building itself. Is a you know the name of it is on the building. But when you drive in, there's a little sign right here that says Lester J. Gates. And, as and well. that is the loop there. That's the front of the loop. This is the loop itself. Yes, yeah, so this is like your drop-off loop, right, where kiddos get dropped off and okay. picked up, you know, before and after school each day. So you're proposing to put it where people circle at the end when they're when they're leaving the. There's the, is that your recommendation or is that? That's the recommendation in general because there's a lot of signs right here already for handicap access and parking. Uh, so we can't disrupt any of the signage that's here um, for ADA purposes. This is now a walkway, and so this is the first section that is still the middle school road, um, but has area that doesn't currently have signage um, that would be disruptive and could still be the J.J. Gibbons way. Yeah. Yeah. It, again, the, the space here, uh, just for clarity for everyone, this wasn't designed, nor was this designed to have a name to it. So uh, unlike what you have in front of the current building where it's uh, a very clear and obvious you know, gateway to that campus, this is a little bit more combined with the middle school and high school. So the attempt here was to try to give this connection, direct connection to our Gates Middle School truly versus to the high school campus, but make sure that we're not disrupting the flow of you know, the day-to-day -day operation of the middle school. As it stands. Yeah, I, I was just asking because, I, you know, my brother had said something to me. It, it, I'll defer to the committee and w where they want to put it, but um, where the sign for the out front where the school is, that is part of the loop also, isn't it? And that's where people enter to circle around to drop the kids off, right? So it would be facing, w w which way would it be? F it would be. So it would be on the the um, leaving of the. You'd circle around and then you would see it as you're you're leaving the the yard, as opposed to entering. 
It's accurate, and we had a conversation about that. The long and short is simply this. The actual address for Gates and the high school is Cushing Highway. And the trouble is if we put a sign at the entrance, it implies that it has a new road, air quotes road, because again, it's not an official road of situate, yeah. which would throw off a number of things in terms of you know um, mail and so on getting to the Gates Middle School. So that was part of the conversation. Can we put it right at that access road of um, you know First Parish, ultimately, right, where First Parish meets the access? But we landed on this as a way that would be um, still a memorial, ultimately, um, but not interfere with the official address of the Gates Middle School. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think what, may, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think what Joe might be trying to get at is that if it was placed where the handicap spaces are, that would designate, like, the beginning of J.J. Gimmons Way versus um, you see it when you're leaving. Is it, did, has DPW looked at the space of the, you know, that the, that area where the handicap spaces are, um, if there's an if there was a spot where it could be put. We can certainly bring it back to have it re-examined. Uh, yeah. My recommendation would be this space, again, because I think it minimizes the impact here. And while I'm certainly not an expert in um, and sort of sign building in general, there's a lot more concrete back here. And so you're going to have to put a hole in your concrete in some capacity to get that sign potentially. And then maybe you put it back here, but there's already signs here. So my point is there's been a, some conversation about where that might be able to go to be still an, um, an honor uh, to Mr. Gibbons, but do in a way that would be, um, that wouldn't disrupt the rest of the signage that communicates to families and, and uh, visitors where to go and where to park and so on. I mean, I don't want to do anything to disrupt the concrete more than it's, our <laughs> it's already been disrupted. Yeah. But I think when we're putting up a sign um, to honor somebody, it should, I think it should be at the entrance, whereas versus like when you're leaving, people might not even see it if, if when they're leaving. That's my opinion. So we'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll take that and we'll postpone it. We'll bring it back to uh, the group and see if we can't come with uh, a new recommendation of the committee. Well, do we have to vote on the exact position or do we have to just vote on na naming? That's up to the committee. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're voting on renaming the circle, not necessarily where it's being placed. Correct? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any other input on the placement? I would say we vote tonight, and then from there we can make a decision on where it needs to go. I mean, if there's no better place, I mean, I, personally, I'm agnostic to it. I get, I get your point. Um, people would definitely see it at the bottom. I know where that sidewalk is, where the kids come out. You know, they're walking out. You, they, it wouldn't be hard to see with all the cars there. At the beginning, I can see there could be an issue with um, the handicapped spots. You don't want the sign to get lost as you're yeah. coming in. Did we look at the inner grass? Um, were you coming to the loop or no? This here where the tree is? Yes. And all of this. Uh, all of the locations were considered. And we can certainly go back to the drawing board and no, reconsider them for sure. We looked at this area here as well. There's some signage here near the parking lot that has wayfinding signs. We looked here as well. There's some signage that's also wayfinding too. Um, we just have a lot of information that we share with families as they drive in. Um, if I can evoke my, um, my inner Mr. Hayes, there's a lot of that information. It's all very good information, but we're trying to be considerate of um, all that information as people drive in. In going through that multiple times, in terms of where it would actually be seen, I think where the star is now makes sense, just in terms of as you're leaving, you can actually see the sign versus having it be, being behind cars or being behind kids. But I mean, personally, I said we voted tonight and then leave the, leave the location Vote the for the transfer later. pending a location, and I can come yeah. back with a new recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, we, we don't want to hold this up. Uh, I move the school committee suspend policies FFB and FFA. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I move that the school committee transfer the John Gibbons Way, J.J. Gibbons Way sign from the Old Gates driveway to the Lester J. Gates Middle School driveway at a location to be determined. Joseph Gibbons. Sorry, I was reading two things at once. I'm sorry, Joseph, Joseph Gibbons Way. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I move that the school committee vote to reinstate policies FFB and FFA. Second. All those in favor? 
Aye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Okay, next up is... Um, in a request to a swap to do the Yeah, so we're going to look at the policies first and then go back to the video Please. board. Okay. So what I have for you this evening is, again, uh, this is more old business follow-up to a conversation we had at our last meeting. Um, we took a look at um, fundraising-related policies before the school committee. Uh, just as a reminder, we have our subcommittee composed of community members, staff members, school leaders, as well as school committee representatives that take a look at Matt, um, mask re recommendations, DESI recommendations, and illegal recommendations for changes in policy. Uh, the first one we have in front of you is JJE, which is student fundraising activities. At our last meeting, you saw the red line of that, which is all the ads, drops, recommend recommended changes, and edits. What you see in front of you today is the clean version of that, essentially get rid of all of the red lines that the committee had uh, agreed to, and um, this is your, your clean version ready for a vote. Change I have is just needs a period on that where sales are. Second paragraph. Second line down. Second right at the end of there. Thank you. Period will be added. Anybody have any questions about this policy? I this at the last meeting, but for that last paragraph where it says no money collections of any kind may be stored in the schools, should this be? We expanded any? that language because it was no money collection um, was something like would be kept in the schools or, or maybe it was no money collection will be stored, period. So we, just, we clarified by no money of any kind collection will be stored in the schools um, without the consent okay. so that we can avoid having, you know, um, $50 from a sale of something right. in someone's desk, which uh, exposes them to liability, the district to liability, those sorts of things. Okay. Um, then my second question to that is, should it be, since we referenced the principal and the superintendent higher up, I mean, should you be approving all of these or the superintendent, or should it be the superintendent or the building principal? That's, that is up to the committee. MASC does recommend that it goes through the superintendent. Um, about two years ago, there was a number of, sort of high profile issues around the state, not here in situate at all, but that's the impetus for MASC's recommendation. Okay, that makes sense. I just, you know, do you really need to see all of these requests? You know what I mean? There's not as many as you'd think, and I guess the other thing you could do is, you know, going forward, if the superintendent felt like there was just too many of these, you could always put an amendment forward and say, look, and or pointy, or, um, you know, just delegate that to the principals. But, yeah, I think, I think given at this moment, that I, I feel that's completely comfortable as a superintendent to handle that. I think that any superintendent would be able to handle the, I don't know, dozen or so that would come across. Uh, I move to approve policy JJE uh, as amended with the period at the end of the second paragraph. Thank you for that catch. Second. Uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. The next policy. Mm -hmm. Come on up. So we had the same thing. This is your clean version. Um, no red lines. Took a look at the red lines last time. Um, this is public solicitation in schools, focused predominantly on like um, commercial sales and fundraising activities in the schools, ultimately. Could you clarify what a commercial sale would be? Sure, it would just be bringing in um, some product that's ultimately made outside of our schools and sell, selling it for um, some profit. Not by the school, but I'm thinking of like the mattress fundraisers that some towns have. Oh, is that on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I see a lot of them. I haven't seen them in Situate, but. Um, yeah. 
would that constitute a commercial sale? It would, yeah. yeah. And the intention, if you see that second paragraph, number one and two, is that whatever those might be, really well-intentioned as they are, that there's no direct solicitation of kids or employees in the district, uh, and that there's not, we're not using class time, right? So you see number two, like no general or class distribution of commercial fundraising, et cetera, takes place. Um, the, the purpose really is there, we just wanna make sure that if you're doing this, which is well-intentioned and potentially good for kids, that it's not interrupting teaching and learning, which should be our primary focus, right? Any other questions on this policy? Do I hear a motion? Move to approve policy KHI. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Close that guy out. And your last one. So KHB's advertising in schools, uh, this is the policy I think we spent the most time on the past month and was at the center of our conversation regarding the video board proposal that you have in front of you tonight and you had in front of you back in December as well. Uh, the committee had made some recommendations to this particular policy to um, expand the language, um, especially in paragraph uh, two, where we outline some of the content and advertising that the committee um, would disallow as part of uh, any potential advertising going forward on a video board, et cetera. And so you see that expanded language there. Again, ultimately, that uh, any advertising that violates our core values would not be uh, noted as acceptable. Uh, this is your clean version, the red line you saw on December 9th, and uh, answer any questions you might have. Any questions on this policy? No. Okay, do I hear a motion? Move to approve policy change. All those in favor? Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now moving back to the video board, video scoreboard proposal. Thank you, so um, some, some illness, a bug going through some of our team, so I apologize. Um, both Peter and Bill are able to make it today. What you have in front of you here is uh, the same proposal you saw again in December that we had the initial discussion on regarding um, the pursuit of an LED scoreboard. Uh, again, it, uh, uh, quick terms would be uh, an addition to the existing scoreboard, a video board, a video display system that would allow um, things like replay and uh, other videos about our students, about our sports, about some arts programs, you name it, whatever we're having out on the field um, that could be streamed direct to our audiences. The cost about $145,000, and the proposal here would be to raise that funding, that, that money, through um, advertising on the scoreboard. And uh, as we discussed back in December, the model would be um, reaching out to community organizations and companies for donations in exchange for time, their commercial, sort of air quotes around commercial, on the scoreboard. Uh, and if that total amount, $145,000, is reached, we would purchase the scoreboard and then follow through with any obligations to air, again, um, their videos or, or other commercials regarding you know, local businesses uh, in exchange. You see the benefits that uh, Bill and Peter outlined for you the other day. Um, the action plan here is one I want to spend a little bit of time on. If this would be uh, approved by the committee, along with obviously the policies, you can see that Mr. Louette and Mr. Umbriana would begin working to explore possible sponsorship agreements with, again, local uh, companies and organizations, and if the funding were to total that $145,000 to be able to order the video display sometime in February. Um, you mentioned uh, that the, the form of advertising could be video. Has that been determined, or would be just like um, uh, companies, like logo? Yeah, so it really depend on the amount that they give, and we've got a few different models that are out there. Um, the larger the donation, the more time you'd want to have, right? So mm -hmm. a smaller donation might be a logo, and a larger donation might be a video. Um, it would also allow you know other organizations that aren't companies necessarily to maybe share some messaging around um, mm -hmm. you know 501c3s and those sorts of things as well. Yeah. So it, we haven't decided; there hasn't been a decision around. 
um, if it is just video or a logo, but the capability of the screen and could do all, anything, mm -hmm. sort of a variety of those things. Okay. No, I, I asked this question last time. I just want to be sure. So if they are not successful in raising the estimated cost, then they will delay potential order or just put the project on hold? Both. That's correct. Okay. And so this is an estimated timeline. Um, they anticipate that there'd be some interest from communities, just seeing some other um, school districts in the state and in New England that have done something very similar. But ultimately, if there's not, I appreciate that, you know, situated in this region is not a heavy commercial region necessarily, then the money would simply be um, not donated ultimately. So we wouldn't accept the money. We simply accepted interest of donation, get to that amount, collect the donations, and make the purchase. But if ultimately we feel like there's just not going to be that amount of interest, then no donations would be accepted and we'd not move forward with this project in this way. And maybe find a, you know, pursue a different or an alternative solution to, to getting that video board paid for. Okay. No, it's, it's, it seems like a very aggressive, uh, about timeline. a month away. Yeah. Uh, again, that's a timeline that's based on just some insight and feedback from other districts that have done something very similar. They found that once you put the word out, in a month you've got people who either yes or no. And I think that's especially true, again, in a community like ours. There's not a massive commercial base, so the number of asks you have are going to be limited, and it's sort of yes or no, right? So I don't anticipate that the legwork there is going to be dragging on for months. And is there going to be a vetting process? Um, who, who would be part of the vetting process to determine who gets to advertise on the scoreboard? So again, per the policy that you just approved, um, those would all get, as we talked about last time, sort of built up into one slate so that we're not doing this ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. That slate would go by me. I'd do the initial vet just to you know, be respectful of your time. So if a beer company wants to advertise, I'm not going to waste your time. No. And then um, once we've got that slate, it would come across to the school committee. Yeah. The 145,000 estimated cost is that that's a one-time fee, correct? And then, do we do we have an estimate of what the recurring cost would be year over year, just for general maintenance? We did. We looked into it. The the year-to-year -year maintenance is almost minimal, and I'm not trying to undersell it. It just really is. Uh, the board itself is like a. It's not PVC, but it's the feel of the material. It's um, got like a 10-year warranty on it, and so we don't expect to have significant maintenance costs. That said, as part of the presentation you saw back in December, the committee and the team could set aside funds from ongoing commercial use to be able to be put forward toward the maintenance. So, you know, one section a few years from now is not working, and it costs a few hundred bucks to repair. Funds from that would come up, and you'd be able to spend it on replacing that section, for example. Well, that was my next question. I mean, we're not expecting, at least as of right now, any of the money to come for this to really come out of our operational budget, correct? That's the intention here is that no dollars come out of the, the operating budget in any way and that ultimately it's self-sustaining. In some of the examples that they saw in the research, they were finding that repairs weren't being done until six to eight years out and that the repairs, again, were pretty minimal and were usually being covered well within the amount of resources coming in from annual um, advertising. So we expect that to be the same here. We're using very similar equipment and we've got a similar scale. I'm sorry, my last question. So in the January, February timeframe, we talked about payment schedules. Do we have to pay the 145000 up front, or is that something we can work out with um, Dactronics to? It has to be up front. So there's no payment plan with the company. Um, it would be a full payment up front. But again, we could make a determination as to whether or not we have that resource um, that would ultimately be donated. And once it would be donated, we'd collect all donations, and then that would be one transaction with Dactronics versus, you know, paying over monthly periods. And you do just like you would do with any large purchase. You'd pay some proportion up front, and then you'd keep some in arrears to make sure that the project was done and done to completion and done to the full spec of the work. I just want to make sure we're not fronting $145,000 out of our budget next absolutely. month. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, we're trying to recoup the money to absolutely you know, not have a curriculum. No, absolutely not. It would be all or nothing, but only if we have the full amount ready to be donated. Okay. Perfect. That's a good question. Thank you. I just have one comment. Um, and I know that, you know, probably the hot topic here, if this is successful, and I certainly, certainly hope that it is, is how the, well, for the first year, if we um, generate more than 145000 how those funds are spent. I know that's going to be our next decision to make. 
Yeah, and again, it would be just like you um, do um, for your $41.5 million budget anyway, right? And we have a conversation about here's all the resources that we have, here's the recommended places that they're being allocated and um, spent on. We have a dialogue about it, and it gets built as part of uh, the operating budget. Just as a reminder, uh, maybe more for folks who are in the audience curious about this, the policy we have there is that this money, though, would not supplant our budget, which is super important. That is, it would not be money to replace existing money or existing programs or staffing or equipment or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It would be to support it, right? So um, you need new something that's not currently in the budget. You need replacement equipment. The board needs maintenance, repairing, training, whatever it might be. Um, so I just want to offer that distinction as an important, to underscore that distinction as important. So in terms of the money, it's a private question for you, Paul. Are we allowed to hold money year over year in an account for this, or would we have to spend the money? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this would be in its own separate account? Yep. We would be able to, it's, there's a certain, we'd have to go to town meeting to have a, a, a revolving account that would go year to year. So there's, a, I, I think it's 150, uh, no. I forget what the chapter is, but there's some that you have to spend, like full day kindergarten you have to spend by June. Yep. Um, but um, uh, gate yes. receipts, gate receipts, you do not. You could, student you, yeah, student activities you can roll over, and there's a certain statute uh, that allows you to do that. It's a half versus 152 and a half versus 152, you know, and a quarter. You know, it's, it's but I'll, I'll get that um, exact. In doing that at town meeting in October, November, or next yep. year is fine. We would, it would be within time. whatever time frame we need. The, the, the mechanics of the accounting would work like a student activities account. Right. It's a relatively small account. Uh, I just want to temper the expectations about the revenue stream that this is going to bring yeah. in. It's going to be modest. Good, but modest. So I just don't want to, I don't want to spend money that's probably not going to come in. It's good money, and I think we can get to this 145, but I wouldn't anticipate hundreds of thousands each year. No, no, I, I was more concerned about the, the mechanics behind the scenes and making sure we had that all lined up. Yep. Joe, did you have a question about yeah, this? Yeah, I just had one question, um, Superintendent Griffin. Do we have a policy um, with regard to who we will um, accept advertising from and who we will not? It's a really great question. It's actually what we just amended here. Um, I won't go through it all with you, but just to, again, refresh. We originally had a policy, KHB, which completely prohibited it entirely. So over the past, gosh, I don't know, six, seven months, we've been exploring different models that other school districts around the state and around uh, New England have used to expand that to allow advertising, but to do it in a way that's considerate of the core values of our school district, to remind ourselves that we're not just a high school here, but we're pre-K to 12, and then we have community members and families and small children, but to also allow that there are some um, advertising streams that we could tap into to expand some of our resources and ultimately pay for this. So the short answer, we didn't have one. As of two minutes ago, we do. For instance, you go to some places and there are political advertisements. Are political advertisements going to be accepted? I, I don't see that in there. It's silent about that, and that would be a decision ultimately by the committee. I would, again, in my experience, say, generally speaking, you are going to cater to small companies in your region, right? You're going to cater to like yeah. mom and pop, like pizza places and car dealerships and those sorts of things. Um, it would ultimately be the decision of the committee as to any other you know, expansion beyond that. Um, yeah, that's my answer. That there. is a good question, but I'm not sure if maybe the town uh, bylaws on political signs, which was recently changed, yeah. would take precedence. But no, maybe we can look into that. Yeah. Because I've, I've been to some sporting events where the sign says, compliments of Congressman so and so Smith. Sure. Or, you know, is that a case by case basis here that you, you would look at that or? I think it's, it's more than a case by case. I think it would be a precedent that the committee may set ultimately and say like, we don't want to get involved with that at all. It's just easier yeah. that way. Or we do and here's yeah. some criteria. Um, and I'd say that if, you know, if things like that were something the committee wanted to get involved in, they'd probably want to make an update to the ad advertising policy to offer some criteria and, um, and guidance on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, where are we? 
So um, my request to the committee would yeah. be to approve uh, this proposal, and we'll set the team off on uh, moving forward with it if you did approve it, and obviously keep you up to date with where they stand. Okay. Um, all right, so any, if there aren't any other questions about the scoreboard proposal, I would entertain a motion. Uh, move to uh, purchase a new LED video scoreboard to the renovated track and field facility located at the Sichuan High School, with the understanding that the $145,000 estimated cost will be raised through scoreboard advertising sponsorships. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for that. We'll keep you up to date. Thank you. Good luck. Um, next up is the out of country field trip uh, that we already were presented and we just need a vote tonight. Yep, and actually we, we had to double check that. There were okay. some uh, questions around oh, the, no the language. The language was good, we double checked it. So Jake, uh, we didn't want to have him come back okay. out here and do that. You're good to go. You can certainly skip We just that need part. to vote on it. You don't even need to vote on Nothing. it? Nothing. It's good. Okay. He's good, it's all set. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, then next up is the South Shore Educational Collaborative Annual Report. Mm -hmm. I really have very little presentation here just to share with you this is the annual report. Uh, each year you receive this annual report from the South Shore Collaborative. That's a collaborative that provides services to students with disabilities here in our community that ultimately may not be able to be served at this moment by our in-district programming. Um, uh, again, each year you assign someone from the school district to serve on their board. Uh, you uh, each year do assign me to do that. I'm happy to do it and uh, receive the annual report from the collaborative the other day and bring it to the committee today. Uh, my ask of the committee is to vote to approve the annual report. And if you have any questions, uh, I can certainly explore them with you. Anybody have any questions? Uh, do I hear a motion? Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for that. All right, next up is the uh, Cushing and Havily SOI update. Mm. So we had a bunch of great news the first half of the meeting. I've got some less than exciting news the second half. Uh, over the past, gosh, year and a half or so, we've been working diligently to put forward an SOI, a statement of interest, uh, to the MSBA uh, to ultimately um, combine our Cushing and Hadley facilities and build a new elementary school. That would be the first step in a five to seven year process to, to deliver a new building for us. Um, we were accepted into the last stage of their process, which is really exciting. And again, we were happy to do that part. It's called the senior study, where um, about the top eight to 10 applicants, SOIs around the Commonwealth, are invited to sit down and talk with um, like a visiting group from the MSBA. They walk the building and uh, take a look at the vision that you have and then see like, how is the building physically holding up, et cetera. Unfortunately, we received notification from the MSBA that they will not be selecting our combined SOIs for this round of funding. It's disappointing, I'll be very frank with you. It's something that the team has been working really hard on for, gosh, again, two years. Um, our teaching staff, our principals, Paul, myself, um, put together hundreds of pages of research for them. Um, but that being said, I'm sure you have some questions, so I've got a couple of answers for you and they can certainly open up. Um, to other questions that you might have. So the first is like, why didn't we get accepted, right? Uh, that's the question that I asked. It's the first thing I did when I called them. The, the short answer is they were simply more urgent projects in the Commonwealth. Uh, it's done on need, and while those buildings certainly have need, there are apparently other buildings in our Commonwealth that have more need. And I just remind you of the um, age and condition of the Old Gates Middle School when you built this middle school. Um, over 100 years old with some significant needs. And our Cushing Hadley schools are older, you know, just over a half century, but certainly not in the same age category as maybe some other schools. The second is like, okay, what do we do from here? Well, there's like really two phases that we want to pursue. Um, the first is to make sure that we continue to address any safety and facilities needs at the Cushing and Hadley schools. As you remember, back in October, this committee approved our capital plan and our facilities plan over the next five years. Part of that had projects uh, over the next couple of years for both of those campuses. We'll continue to move with those. It's the reason that we built them into our five-year projections as a backup plan in the event that MSBA ultimately didn't select our proposal. 
The second, which you see there at letter C, uh, is with the committee's approval, uh, I think we should go forward and this district should submit uh, SOIs for April of 2020 for consideration in the next round of funding. Um, in my conversations with MSBA, our SOIs were very strong. We just weren't the highest need applicant at the time. So we can certainly update our analyses and update our research, but the spirit of the proposal, that is the combination of the buildings, uh, doing a brand new building versus a renovation, some of the key you know, components of the proposal, I'd recommend to keep in place and, and move forward with a resubmission. A little bit of the questions if you've got them. Um, no, I thank you for that explanation why we weren't chosen. I, I kind of guessed it, that, um, you know, a lot of people, this is a great program for communities in the state, and a lot of communities are now taking part, probably more than one in the past. Boston, Boston was added recently. Oh, that's right, that yes, in Boston's in it. So. Sort of changed it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, I'm just wondering, to what extent should we change our request or submission as opposed to, I know that we got Habib involved in it and they came up with their recommendations and so on and then we took that information and moved forward with what we thought was most fiscally and appropriate for the kids. Yeah. Um, how or can we potentially relook at that to figure out if submitting a different type of proposal might be accepted? What do you mean? Um, I've been a big, I've been more of a supporter on a K through two, three through five facility type of project, which I know Habib said was gonna be a lot more expensive, mm -hmm. um, versus I know that we put in a two part MS, well with the expectation that Wampatuck was gonna need to be renovated. Mm -hmm. Do we need to change the language and our intentions to potentially better position ourselves to be accepted? Um, or does, is there any reason to have someone like Habib or other come in, or is, is that work already done? So I feel like there's maybe two questions there. The first would be, what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, would be if we change the configuration recommendation, would that better uh, position our proposal to be accepted? And the show is no. The MSPA typically doesn't have a preference as to what you choose, so it's not part of their rubric. They just want to make sure that it meets the needs of your kids and your families and your community, and they've done due diligence in that research and analysis. I know Ms. Brandolini sat on the committee with me that we spent about a year doing that research and analysis. Uh, if the committee as a whole has uh, an, a, the belief that we should redo that, I would say that would be something you may want to do with the next superintendent coming in, because it takes about a year to do that thoughtfully and do that well. Um, so that's the first item. The second might be, you know, is that still the right fit? And so this question of like, do you want to bring in another company to come do an analysis of the facilities and make recommendations? You certainly could. It would be my recommendation to the committee not to do that. My opinion would be that would be a waste of taxpayer dollars. Your current analysis is only about a year and a half old. Uh, any high quality engineering firm uh, may have a different spin on it, but will probably come to very similar conclusions. I can't make that as a, uh, 100% confidence because I'm not an engineering firm, but just in my experience, uh, they're going to look at the two buildings and make similar recommendations because there's only so many lenses you can look through. Those are my two statements about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I think that we all in, probably all understand that just it's difficult competition to be approved and the fact that we got through step one, phase one is, is, is good, but we, we just missed out. So obviously mm -hmm. we would look for a way to strengthen our application, and I don't know how we can do that. I don't know if we can, can do that. It's, Again, just a, I, it's a numbers game, and it depends how many other folks reapply. If there is a way to strengthen the actual application, I asked that question uh, several different ways to the point where they were feeling frustrated by me. Uh, the position that they shared with me was, there's no way to make the application better. You just need a school that's older and in worse condition. And we don't want that, right? We want to be proactive. But that's the reality of just the, the current state of building facilities, community facilities, public facilities in the Commonwealth. Um, I, just, I, had, I had shared with uh, Superintendent Griffin, I looked at the last buildings that the MSBA approved, and there were a lot of combinations. Mm -hmm. Rockland did a combination. Consolidation. Consolidation of schools. They were nine, there was a 900 person, 900 student elementary school. There's like two of those 900, 700 elementary schools. We looked at a lot of those configurations prior to this. 
we have a, a very nice school in the Jenkins and a good, we've already put two and a half, three million dollars from the MSBA money into the Wampatuck. So we basically would have to pay back the difference between, you know, just like we had to do with uh, old, old Gates, we had to pay back some money um, because we got some money back, a million dollars, not we got MSBA money back on what we did to the old gates a few years back. So we got to give back some money. It was, like Superintendent Griffin said, it was not a reason for the consolidation because that's exactly what they're looking at lately uh, in the last couple of schools that they're built, especially at the elementary level. Uh, the grade configuration is a little bit tougher because we'd have to do some addition maybe to Wampatuck. Um, and put a gym on or something, something like that. Um, and to, yeah, concurrently. concurrently at the same that time. That might be our nickel. Out of, would be entirely out of the right, town. right. And so, so just as a, so I can just yep. that, not to belabor that, that item, and Ms. Brandolini, feel free to share because I know you were with that group of us for a year or so. Um, we looked at that analysis quite a lot. And if you pursue a great configuration, and again, there's pros and cons to both. Not to, again, not to rehash that whole thing again, um, but. It's a wash academically, right? The data shows it's a wash academically, but the cost of the taxpayer shows a substantially higher cost. And so we, you know, surmise that with all the other needs in the community, um, we'd want to be considerate of our taxpayers and use a model that meets the needs of our kiddos, but does it in a way that is fiscal, as fiscally responsible as possible. And if you want to add anything to that, I completely agree. We were that committee was extremely thorough and. We played devil's advocate every single meeting. We had some great conversation, and we had we did homework, we did site visits, we talked to principals, we talked to teachers, we talked to families, friends. We did so much research, and it, it was a wash academically. We really kind of could have seen it go both ways. It came down a lot to, um, you know, how many children under 10 do you want in a building together? And in situ, it is a little bit unique with some of the towns we looked at, like a Hanover was going from, they, were, they had the two schools. We, we have the four, we were in like this awkward, we were kind of too, the numbers just didn't fit for us. Our elementary number would be so high, it would be up like 900 kids plus in a building, 10 and under. That's scary. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's that, it's, it's the way, it's because we have the four schools, the way it just simply doesn't fit the puzzle just doesn't fit evenly together with the four. So consolidating down to three would work, but you can't take rid, get rid of two. You know what I mean? And in doing so would require you to do major renovations to yes. at least one of your existing buildings, and you yeah. wouldn't be able to do that potentially through MSBA simultaneously, which right. means that's going to be entirely on the tax base. Could it be done if you waved the magic wand and had unlimited funds? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be as pragmatic and considerate of the resources as possible. Yeah. And the grade configuration conversation is, I mean, it's, it, it was kind of a tough one because there, there are a lot of benefits to aligning it that way, yeah. um, especially for resources and teachers and staff. Mm -hmm. um, families seem to be split 50-50 on really, um, traditional situate home school, neighborhood school, walking to, you know, walking to your neighborhood school with your friends and the folks who live on the same street with and um, keeping it that way. Um, there was a lot of concern for parents in terms of having children, you know, what if you didn't go to, the way it's split, you could have kids on, you know, two kids so in, in your own home, you could have, you know, your, your kindergartner and your second grader go on one bus, but then if you have, um, you know, a fourth grader and a middle schooler, you're having kids split, you know, it was kind of chaotic to have, you know, your, your six-year-old and your eight-year-old getting on different buses 
different school times, how does it work for buses and traffic, and it was, it just kind of exploded that way. So. And I know just one, one more thing to add, just to underscore again, there are legitimately good reasons to consider mm -hmm. both models, mm -hmm. too. I want to, don't want to oh, analyze yeah. one or the other. But they're really 50-50 in terms of the research and current data that's out there. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be a clean split. You, even if you did that model, you'd still have at least two buildings that would be one great right. configuration, right? Like, there'd be at least two K through twos or uh, two exactly. three through fives. And given the numbers, it, end up, it would be an inverted pyramid. So yeah. you'd probably end up having uh, one K through two, and then two three through fives, right? And then back to six through eight. And that's not the intention yeah. of grade um, level right. configuration. It anyway. would never be exactly grade configured neatly and cleanly. Right. There wouldn't be just two schools yeah. to do that. So you could have kids going to school together, you know, early elementary years, then splitting for the mid elementary years, then coming back, back together. But I, we hear, you know, everybody. <laughs> no, I remember all. The, I remember the meetings, and we talked about it for a while. I just, I'm just. I guess my point is that we have a old middle school that we have no plans for, and I know that we can't use it for a school per se. But something has to be done with it, and I just. I think I mentioned this a year ago. Is that, I wish that. Um, as we, as a school committee, make these decisions that the uh, larger town can also be involved in saying, hey, we need to do something with the schools. We have this building. Can we somehow utilize that? I absolutely recognize that the report that we did, that was super expensive, and I understand that, and, and I don't disagree with it. I just want to get that discussion going, I guess, now that we're kind of back to reapplying. So but as you said before, we can reapply and that money would be good for the Hatherley School. It could be good for anything. Nope. You have, if you reapply, it's only good for what your statement of interest states. So our current one is for Hatherley School. Your current one is for both buildings. You have two SOIs that this committee already approved and the Board of Selectmen already approved. They are to consolidate, that is, no longer use Cushing and Hadley and build a new building. Site has not right. been determined as part of the SOI at all. That would be okay. something you'd want to you'd do as a next right. Okay. Got it. Okay, understood. And if we vote um, to to move forward, if we voted to approve another application uh, submitted in April, um, would the would the previous uh, approval by the board of selectmen carry over? No, it starts fresh. Everything's okay. fresh. All right. So we would approve tonight, and they would have to approve. No, nope. all I'm asking for from the committee today is to just, uh, vote to charge me and this team to start working on an SOI, just like we did last time. Mm -hmm. This committee would still have to look at the SOI and review it and decide, yes, this is something we want to support. No, go back to the drawing board, et cetera. I take it and then move through the process from there. Okay. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, too. The, even though our, when we had applied for the Gates Middle School one and got picked up instantaneously, that was grab that mic and break that was off. quick. It's atypical to get, sorry, it's atypical, correct me if I'm wrong, to get picked up your first application. It's typical to go through a few cycles and. It, it really does vary. Again, if there's a very high needs building, like the old gates, it gets picked up right away. It's evident this yeah. is the top need. Um, but there are districts that go through this five, six years in a row, and some that say, you know what, thanks MSBA, we're gonna go on our own and go as a community too. We're not at that place, my recommendation is you're not at that place yet as a community. I'd give this project process a try. The funding is substantial. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I guess uh, the next question is, do I hear a motion? Motion. And it's not, it's not written out. No. Okay. Um, motion to have Superintendent Griffin update. Oh, wait, where am I? Mm -hmm. Are we going to? You can read the last sentence and see. Nicole, maybe. Oh, motion to uh, um, apply to resubmit the SOI for April 2020 in consideration in next year's round. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Next up is the superintendent search form. Search firm. All right. Um, so we I, we've received two proposals. 
Um, and we just have to decide between which one. Uh, I'll, I'll just give my opinion first. We can go right down the line. Um, the mask one was a little, um, well, it was more money. And it had some cut and paste issues. <laughs> uh, I prefer the NASDAQ one. I, we, having gone through that process uh, with NASDAQ, I felt it very professional and quick and efficient. They kept everybody focused. Um, yeah, I think that, and this is for my first time through this process, and um, I guess what I, my first comments were that the only organization I had heard of was Mask, and it was simply because we are part of their organization. Um, and they have provided some valuable information to us as school committee members and offered some services. Obviously, that's their way, I believe, of enticing us to utilize their search features. I'm assuming it's part of their goal. Um, so for that, I was hoping for a really strong application. Um, I didn't necessarily find that. Um, in terms of the NESDEC, I guess, my feedback or my question would be what Janice mentioned that she was impressed with their search process last time. Um, I don't know if there's any other comments about the process and how it went and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't necessarily have an opinion yet on, on each one, but those are my initial thoughts and comments. Well, I would say I agree with Janice. Obviously, there's a price differential, and the, the NASDAQ one was much clearer. It, just the layout was cut and dry more, I guess you could say. It was very clear, but um, I can appreciate Peter's points on mask and, and our relationship with them. Mike. Um, I, I guess I was a little bit unclear on the NESDEC pricing. I know that there was a fixed, like, $7,500, um, but there's a lot of a la carte pricing added to that, and I wasn't sure how best to compare equals to equals, because I don't think for, I know that there were different prices or different, uh, yeah, different prices, but I think you were getting a little bit more, from my opinion, in mask for that price as you were for the NESDEC, and I couldn't quite compare apples to apples. I don't know if Paul or anyone well, you I could. Mean, the only one that you would probably take a look at uh, would be the $1,400 to go for the brochure, which is, that would bring you just a little over $9,000. And then you're comparing apples to apples. So that's the $1,400 brochure that Mask would be sending out for the $9,000. And then NESDAQ would be putting it on as an a la carte or $1,400 more. So that would be a little bit over $9,000 for that. Yeah. So those would be very similar Very similar policies. from there on out. They're both going to do the focus groups. And if you want to do um, more uh, going out to uh, national uh, publications, they're both similar. I think um, masks tops out at 2000 bucks. I think, for all the um, uh, publications and everything else that you guys want to do and so NASDAQ might be a little bit more if we want to go national um, so so I think the apples to apples would be about 9900 was it 9900 I think for a mask and about 9000 for a NASDAQ. 95 9500 for a mask and I, I think then you're pretty much apples to apples adding on the brochure part that's something we're would we would do yep okay we, so it's we, really we, not the uh, nine and only just got a new one today from uh, um, some place down, uh, down in Marion well old Rochester okay thank you from NESDAQ I mean for mask uh, mask is doing uh, old Rochester so they just got one of those today and it's pretty similar to the one we get for NESDAQ mm -hmm. so yeah, so again, so mm -hmm. you're looking at, um, so let's just go with numbers again. It was 9,500 mm -hmm. for mask, right? Okay, yep. And that includes the advertising brochure. 
We believe, yes. And the NASDAQ was 7,500? Right. Mm -hmm. Plus 1,400 for the brochure. Mm -hmm. So 8,900. Seven, seven fifty. So basically the same price. They're just marketing it differently. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm looking for. I've never worked with any of the. I don't. I mean, I know their their goals are the same. I think it's important to have people let us know how the experience went last time. Mm -hmm. I think overall, Nasdaq did a really good job of putting the search committee together and keeping them on point and then following through through the entire process from start to finish. Um, I did notice with masks, it looked like they were nickeling and diming here and there. It was mileage for travel um, they included that we'd have to pay for any postage. So there were little things in there too that I think the 9500 would probably go up at least a couple hundred bucks. Um, but overall, I mean, after looking at both uh, search proposals. I mean, NASDAQ seemed to stand out as a better proposal to me. Their proposal was better presented. Have we ever used, have we used mask in the past or do we no, always just use I'm not, NASDAQ? And I've been here 14 years. We used NASDAQ the two times and the school committee, I think, um, did Sue, Sue Martin, the school committee did it. And I believe they did, the school committee did Mark Mason when I got here. Themselves? Yes. Right. So we have an option to not use a search firm. So we did it for John and for Ron, mm -hmm. for um, NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work. Yeah. No, I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're paying <laughs> yeah. um, OK. So. Do I hear a motion? Uh, I move the school committee hire NESDAC as the superintendent search firm. Is there a second? I <laughs> <laughs> do want to discuss it more. I, I personally lean toward, I know that the proposal wasn't as clean as the other one, I guess you could say, but I don't know, I lean towards mask um, for change and for our relationship with them. If the prices are equal, mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. And I can only really speak to the experience I had with NASDAQ. I mean, it was just, they just yeah. keep you going. There's no, they don't waste any time um, getting things done. Is there like a list of towns or something like a Yeah. To the back. Yeah. The thing is they included ones from like 10 years ago. Yeah. Mask? Or Both of them did. Both and, it, and it, it's kind of uncomfortable to discuss this, but um, it doesn't say they're tenure, so they may have hired a superintendent for two years, and but they did the search process once they left. Yeah. You know, so like how good were they? Like, is it good to see a ton of names? Right. Not re I mean, yes and no. So it. Well, they present, I mean, I can only speak from what happened with NASA. They, they present you with, how many mics were it, like 20? Oh. They're Are ultimately. You guys, can you guys use the microphone? Sorry. Sorry. We Sorry. Can't hear you. Sorry. I, I mean, I think ultimately they're going to come to the same, give us the same applicant pool, I would Probably. think. I would think. But again, my, 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 the one unknown is that they, here are all of our, towns that we've placed superintendents for, but doesn't give me their tenure. And to me, that doesn't really, doesn't tell me anything, I guess. Yeah. But it was true for both. But I did a little bit of research, and some of these were like 15 or 20 years ago they did these searches. It would be great if they said the superintendent's still there, then that would be a successful placement. Well, unmask, well, I don't know if they're still there, I guess, sorry. Unmask, it has a little asterisk that says completed within the last three years, but then, like you said, you don't know if there's currently still there or how long the other one I mean so the other ones were more than three years ago and you know where are they so I would say that I haven't done my necessary due diligence on really researching both of these but I know you need to make a decision <laughs> and Janice to your question I know we got about 30 applicants from 
NESDAQ last time, and that was the applicants that they had already vetted through the process. Right. I mean, it could be different every time you run. You could have 10 applicants, you could get 500. But they, I know they did a pretty good vetting process to get us down to that set. They did, and then they, 30. you know, they give us our homework and um, whittling it down. Uh, I was just really impressed with how the whole process went. And it might be the same for mask. I don't know. Split. You need a second for us before you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you want there to is comment? a second. Uh, okay. Yeah, before you do comment, you can second. The chair can second so we can. Yeah, comment. All right, I second it. <laughs> so there. <laughs> you just got outvoted. No. No, it's still too. It could be. <laughs> no. All right. All those in favor. Do you want to open the comments? Oh, do okay. you want to open the comments? I, I mean, we've commented a lot. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Do anybody have any comments about the the two particular? Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hi. Hi. Oh, great. There's <laughs> <sighs> uh, Mr. Hayes. I know. Um, all right. I know we have to get this process uh, underway. We're on our timeline. Um, would you feel better? Re I can reconsider. <laughs> I just. I guess I just wanted to. Again, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to know. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to come to my conclusion on this. I think that's that's my point. I don't have any pros or cons. Um, I did recognize the typos in the initial presentation, and I know that that was a problem last time, I believe, um, with mask. Um, and again, this is difficult for me to say, and it's uncomfortable. Um, so I'm not going to say it, but. Uh, I, don't, I guess I don't really care. I just want to find an appropriate candidate. I know, and I don't think any the either company, either organization, has a bearing on who was who finally applies. chosen. Yeah. yeah, and who applies and who's finally chosen. It's probably true. Mm -hmm. So unless you change your mind. <laughs> I don't know. I was just thinking we would try a different road. Maybe it would, I don't know who they reach out to, but I mean, like you said, the candidate pool is probably the same no matter yeah. which search. Uh, since the committee split, w what about having the, the fifth, is the fifth member going to be at the next meeting? I'm Could. Not sure. Maybe that's a way to decide yeah, your. We, we do need to get going on the process, unfortunately. And we know, I think, I, I think we all know. Yeah. Yeah. And you might want to have a meeting next Monday night. Yeah. To get this process started, where you got to you got to pick committees. Yeah. You got to have somebody lead you on those committees. You got to start the brochure. You got a tight timeline. Timeline of people is what we're looking for. That's what it says right in here. So, you know. Do you have any comments, Paul? The last two we had was NESDAQ. Uh, that's that's what I have. I mean, you know, but I, like I said, Bonnie got one today from. What do you mean got one? She got a brochure from. Um, looking for a candidate. Yeah, looking, looking for, for an application. For, for, yeah, for applications. For, and we get them all the time from both both of them, M A S C and NESDAQ. And you see no difference with. I'm sure that yeah. probably not. No. Yeah. Net New England. Mm -hmm. versus Massachusetts. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, national publications, I mean, you know, typical people are around this area that you're looking for. Thank you. Um, Cheryl Rydell, 
I'm wondering, since it seems you guys are split, and one of the one of the points that I heard was, I'm not sure how to evaluate the difference between the two. It seems like maybe having a quick executive meeting afterwards and coming up with a quick summary of the important points that you think you should be evaluating each company on and then grading each of them individually um, might give you some process and a score by which you can determine which one is better off. That way the committee has some input in terms of what they think is important that they're looking from these organizations, for instance, how long is the tenure from the superintendents that they hired for other districts, right? They, 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 they right. They, and you hire them. Right. So it's many applications coming. They go through the screening process of finding the candidates. Right. And then you determine the kind of candidate you would like to hire. And that's also why you have a committee to interview different people and give recommendations. So it's really immaterial which one you choose. No, that, that's, I think that, that's help, that is helpful to understand. And I think that that was just, I needed to hear that. I don't, I think what Janice said is that the other company that they use kept them on track, and that's kind of what you want. You want the pool of candidates, and then we ultimately make the decision. Um, to, I'm not sure if it changes my my uh, my vote, but helpful, nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, right, like the candidates, the pool of candidates will be what it will be, regardless of which company. I'm sure they'll both adequately keep everybody on track and get the process accomplished, hence the list of hirees that have come out of it. For me, it was more of a principle of mask has been helpful to us and supportive, so it was almost like a good, good gesture to select them and also to take a different approach since our last two searches we used, NESDEC, maybe a fresh approach would be just good karma. <laughs> Well, if we can't come to a decision tonight, we're going to have to come back next Monday. Yeah. And you guys are solid on this deck. Like you I, don't have. I only from because I've I because that's we went through the process before and having and I, having knowing the timeline we're under, I know it'll get done. Um, I mean, it's we're under the gun and we need to get it done, and I think Nasdaq will absolutely do that. So. Mm -hmm. So it's just speaking from experience, working with them. Um, I mean, the only other thing we could do is be, if meet, we could meet next Monday between now and then, call the towns and that worked with Mask and ask how they how they felt working with them. Right. Yeah. So. All right. So do you want to have a? Do you, is that what we're going to do? We're going to come back next Monday. Peter, what do you think? We have to, if you, if you, unless you change your vote now. Or you change No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really big deal, and I think we should maybe, if we're split like this, we should probably do, do some that. more research. Okay, and that's fine. That's fine. I but quickly, like you said. Cause yeah, Monday. We're under the gun, for sure. Yeah. All right. We'll have to do it Monday. All right, moving on. Um, F FY20 budget quarterly update, Paul Donlan. Before we get it, just a quick oh, yeah. mechanics. Yes. You want to meet Monday at 6 p.m., same time? Yes. Okay, I'll set that up. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. You have your quarterly update you guys are, are looking for. Your top page uh, is... Um, basically your four major categories of your uh, personnel, um, contract services, materials and supplies, and small equipments. You have your um, receipt, revenue line items. I don't have the grants in here, um, but uh, we're tracking right along with our um, um, revenue coming in. So that is that. You have individual pages. The first page is the administration. It is not the ECC. I should take that out of there. That's a little older. <laughs> Special needs and curriculum. 
Um, obviously, one of the biggest line items here is outside placements. Um, we brought in probably 684,000. I think we're, that is going to be circuit breaker that we're going to lower this number. Uh, we don't, we're not going to quite get all that circuit breaker in. We're going to have to um, find some other um, for the outside placements for this year coming up. And we're hoping to be able to do that with some savings and supplies. Um, you have electricity, natural gas for transportation, for fuels, for the buses and for the vans. We're tracking right along um, in small capital outlay. We've done some, um, we did some purchasing this year of um, the 15 passenger vans and, and so on and so forth. That's why we have a little bit more in our unallocated. Cushing School is just straight personnel and their materials and supplies, their contract services, and we so on and so forth. Hadley School, same thing. Jenkins, same thing. General supplies and salaries. Um, we go to, we get a little bit more of materials and supplies and there's a little bit more left over here in the middle school. Um, we're probably going to have uh, a little surplus here for materials and supplies in the middle school because it's new. It's the third year in. We, we did get an awful lot when we, um, when we bought the, um, when we, FF &E. yeah, FF&E out of the middle, sc uh, middle school budget. The high school is basically, this is where athletics are. This is your contract services, your referees, your, um, your game officials for all that, your buses for athletics. Uh, if we have to go outside, um, that's about $57,000 right now. We've got about $24,000 encumbered. We've got about $80,000 left. Um, so we're tracking, we're in our second season. So that's how much we spent on the first season, about fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. So. Uh, materials and supplies, uh, same thing here. The high school is obviously our biggest user of materials and supplies. Athletics, um, athletic supplies, we've spent 31000 through two seasons. We got about 9500 in, obviously, through the end of December for this season coming up. And we got some money left over for the spring season. Um, and that is it, what's going on for the quarterly update. Is there any questions? Yes. OK. Uh, I know that um, with the addition of some athletics at Gates, are there any additional costs that? Um, the high school th is using? Yeah that are going under the high school athletics? Yes, we are spending some money on busing for the uh, wrestling meets. Mm -hmm. And field and track, we did some during the uh, fall. I don't know how much. It wasn't probably a whole heck of a lot. Mm -hmm. They do have some monies in their, um, their activity funds, um, and we'll make some transfers. Uh, we'll pay some of the uh, stipends for the um, advisors mm -hmm. for the, these uh, individual uh, sports too. So I think there's only what three? Is there one each? They just added. And then golf. The spring. And then spring golf track. is it, yeah, spring track. Okay. And then there's, I think there's golf. So there's wrestling, fall track, cross country, cross country, and uh, spring. Mm -hmm. So there's four right now. Okay. Any other questions? No, so ultimately, Paul, we're um, just going over the outside placements for special ed. Uh, the variance is the 684, correct? Yep. So that's not what you're over budget. Right, but we have yeah. circuit breaker. Correct, so the circuit breaker is the reimbursement from last year's placements, correct? correct? So what is that number that's coming? We haven't got the third and fourth quarter in yet. Okay. So we're going to get that in. We get $1.2 million. So we've got in $600,000. We're going to get another 300 in March. We're going to get another 300 in June. So that will essentially be covered 
essentially. All right. So are we running a deficit for this year? We probably will because we have some. Um, in total, in not just out of district, but in, but in, in total, total, yes. In total, driven predominantly by that number. You have right. point two. You're tracking it at sec essentially mm -hmm. halfway through the year, your second quarter, right? Let's call that seven hundred thousand. That's 1.4, so you're short about 200 roughly. Yeah. There are some lines within here that you can see that we're trending also on surplus, yep. along with the circuit breaker. We're confident that we can close okay. out 20, but 21 is going to be a different conversation. It's going to be really okay. challenging. Right. Okay. So uh, this is a question that I had always asked in the past: is that that particular line item, we're over budget, but we're running good numbers in several other line items, and we can. I don't know what the administration is, but you can move money from one line item to the other to cover this shortfall. Yes. Okay. Yep, that is why there is only one line item for the school department budget. There's 600 line items in here, <laughs> but there is only one line item at the town meeting level. Any other questions for Paul? No? Do you have one question about the budget? No, it's, I believe it's a hundred dollars. It's a hundred dollars activity fee. Money is now coming out of the high school budget. It's not a high school or middle school budget. This isn't right. a competition between the middle school and high school no. budgets. It's we want to give kids athletic opportunities. We have a budget for it. We don't have a athletics budget per se in the middle school, right. and so we utilize the fund that's already set in the high school. But if the high school needed more resources, we find a way to do that as well. So I don't want to um, give credence to any assertion that there's like middle school taking allocation from high school. We haven't made the transfer yet. We'll do that in the spring. Right. So Back to the activity, to the activity fund. fund. So a cross country athlete at the middle school pays one hundred dollars, but a cross country athlete at the high school pays three hundred dollars. The programs are substantially different. Substantial. And a high school program is a competitive program across multiple schools, and a middle school program is not. But so they compete against other schools. Not the same number, not in the same program capacity. So it's not like a state competition at the end, and yeah. it's not the same yeah. scale of the program at all. Yeah. I mean, Although, the, re the wrestling program at the, at the middle school has been around for a long time. And so similarly, the, I mean, now that the, there is cross country, but the activity fund has always covered the cost for the wrestling. Yeah. Um, so the, acti the activity fee that the, all the athletes pay at the middle school level covers the costs, and, and if there's a you know a shortage or, or bus or a bus a bus that might be needed, yeah. that will. Well, I, agree. Well, I think there's yeah. even more. Yeah. Sports at the middle school level. Yeah. But I also feel that there should be a lower athletic fee at the high school level. So. I agree with that, but. <laughs> Nine hundred dollars for a family. Is I, a lot of money. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments or questions? No. All right, thank you, Paul. Okay. Next up is the FY21 budget development update. Okay. High level summary. <laughs> so what I have for you here is uh, an update on our process that we started, gosh, back in November with our timeline. Uh, I broke it down into a few parts, and myself, Paul, um, and Diana will share some, some information with you. Again, just a reminder that um, we take a zero-based budgeting approach, that is we identify um, what our needs are and try to build budgets around that rather than simply rolling resources from year to year. Uh, I'll try to be brief and then certainly open up to questions that you may have regarding the process. So uh, part one is just the uh, calendar where we stand right now. We're here in January 9th, um, reviewing just preliminary information for you. Uh, excuse me, uh, January 6th, we're using an overview of budget priorities and preliminary budget. Uh, part two, I just want to share with you as a reminder that uh, our budget and all of our resources should really be focused on the educational program for kids. We set across five priorities as part of our strategic plan. Uh, one focused on curriculum, one focused on engaging and educating all kids, one on the development of resilient, balanced, healthy children, one making sure that we're thinking about flexible learning environments, and the last is this idea of local to global community engagement and partnership. And so as we develop our budgets, as we develop our programs, as we develop recommendations, we're always trying to find, um, uh, ask the questions and make sure we find the connection between uh, our priorities and the things that we are allocating resources for. 
One priority that you saw about a month and a half ago that I just want to underscore with you is enrollment. Uh, again, I'm in the interest of everyone's time tonight, I, I won't go through all of it in excruciating detail because you had this about a month or so ago, but I think it's important as a refresher. That first uh, graph you see there is our overall enrollment, a historical as well as projected. It goes from 2014-15, projecting out to about 2023-2024. Uh, as you can see, we're still going to be uh, just under 3,000 kiddos, about um, 2,900 and change students for next year. I also gave you a breakdown, though, based on some of the conversations that the committee had at the enrollment meeting and some of the requests you had by um, grade span. So here you see historical and projected enrollment just for elementary schools. It's our entire elementary school program. Again, from 2014 to 2023, 2024. Um, you can see in general we've been on an enrollment increase in the elementary schools, but interestingly enough right here at 2023, 2024, we project an enrollment decline currently based on the number of births in town, um, which happens to be down in 2018, which will ultimately project to the kindergarten class of 2023, 2024. Uh, if that's just a blip, that may be a blip. If not, that may change the trajectory of enrollment in the elementary schools in our community. You'd have to wait and see a little bit longer on that. Here are your actual numbers just for 2020 and 2021. Important note that kindergarten enrollment's underway. We have a kindergarten information night actually tomorrow night. We're going to welcome um, our new kindergarten families and talk to them about that process for registering kiddos. You can see that in general enrollment's been up at all of our schools, but happily, so overall, um, up about 16 kiddos for elementary school for next year. Secondary enrollment, uh, similarly, uh, you can see we have both the middle school and high school combined and then broken down by grade for you. In this case, that enrollment's been down about 24 kiddos altogether projected for next year. And I broke that down for you in some, some graphs as well. Again, you can see the middle school uh, enrollments overall declining and then we see an uptick again for 2023 2024 and while a little bit more up and down at the high school a similar trend with an uptick 23 24. Part three is uh, the part that Paul was alluding to a few minutes ago in his quarterly um, update for the budget so uh, as I'm sure you know a large majority of our resources come directly from our taxpayers here in town we always try to do right by um, our community and by the resources and contributions that they give uh, again I always try to give this committee both historical current and projected when we talk about our budget so you can see our historical allocations back to FY 15 uh, projected for FY 21 uh, about 39.5 and then projected for FY 22 that you see there as well So I'll give you a snapshot of FY21. There's a couple of categories that are important to keep in the back of your mind as we do so. The first is just the projected operating costs. Again, that represents zero-based budget, asks the question, what is it that we need to educate our kids to the best of our abilities and to the level and quality that we always expect here in Situate? It includes um, recommendations for resources and equipment, as well as all of the contractual re um, resources required for steps and lanes and colas across all of our contracts. One thing it does not include that's important to, to note is um, all of our requests for expanded staffing, expanded programs. This year we're looking at just shy of $1.2 million in requests from our team that I'll share with you in just a moment that have been prioritized for additional staffing needs, additional programming, courses, um, those sorts of things to help us continue to innovate. I will share that with you in just a moment. The next item that's important to, to look at will be our circuit breaker appropriation. Um, Again, that'll be circuit breaker appropriation for FY21. Quick reminder about circuit breaker. We receive that, we receive that as a reimbursement in arrears the following year, and it's about 75% of the costs for uh, student services, typically out of district student services, not always though. Um, and that's after we, as a school district, absorb about four times the state's foundation. So 40, what's our number now? 48, 44? 45,793 for FY21. So after we've spent about $45,000 in services, the state would reimburse 75% of the dollars after that amount in the year following, right? Uh, and again, the next is simply the FY21 projected LEA appropriations. So before I show you the snapshot, I wanna just take a moment to share with you just some of these proposals uh, for FY21, again, that are not included in the development number, but I think are important to honor. 
So what we do is we sit down with our entire leadership team and ask the question, what is it that we need above and beyond what we already have to provide service to our students in the best way possible? And we take a look at proposals from all team members, from principals, from curriculum coordinators, from district leaders, um, ranging from new staff to new programs to new large scale purchases of equipment and materials and supplies. We have those conversations as a team. Each uh, team member presents those uh, proposals to the team at large, and we try to take off the hat of an individual school leader or a program leader and look holistically to what the school district needs. And we evaluate those using a rating similar to what Cheryl and Ms. Rydell had just alluded to earlier. Uh, I use this rubric with them. We do top priority, a need versus a want. We take a look at that against uh, a cross-section of five different categories, health and safety, high standards for education, uh, does it meet a strategic objective, what's the scale of impact, right, like a couple of students versus all of our kids, and of course legal and regulatory requirements. We have those conversations over a span of a few days, and then from that, the staff, uh, leadership staff, take all of those recommendations, we aggregate, average those scores, and we rate them essentially on that scale of one to three, one being a want, three being a high priority. You can see them ranked here, and typically what we do at this point in the presentation is I share with you uh, the recommendations at from the leadership team as to which ones we'd like to recommend as part of an operating budget. That said, I'm gonna put that on hold because our current projections show a gap between the current resources that we have and the total operating budget that we need simply to operate our school district at level services. Not level fund, but level services. Maintain the existing high quality education for all kiddos without expanding and adding all of these really good, important, um, programs and staffing that we would need, but at this moment, I don't believe we have the resources currently to be able to afford. So I want to name that for you, but I do want to put a pin in it. So here's our snapshot currently, early in the process for FY21. Our operating costs are projected just over 42 million. You can see that circuit breaker appropriation at just shy of a million dollars. Again, that's paid in arrears based on the services and costs from last fiscal year. In LEA appropriations in terms of the operating costs that we currently expect to need and the total revenue and resources that we have on disposal for, for FY21. So you're obviously wanting to know why, what do we do here, what's that look like? I have some more information for you. So FY21, as I mentioned, the, the budget number that we're at right now, early in the process, just collecting all of the uh, input from the process, includes all of our contractual um, obligations. It also represents, as Paul had mentioned, about 600 budget line items. Um, the majority of them are staffing. About 85% of our overall budget is obviously staff. We have over 500 employees, and only about 15% of our budget is what I'm call stuff, right? material, supplies, equipment, and so on. Uh, what you have in front of you is the top 10 plus two, so top dozen uh, lines that we have out of the 600 uh, based on the current projections that we have and the current requests that are in. I share that with you because this is the, um, the column that draws certainly my attention uh, as we start to look at the budget this early in the cycle. That's the delta between FY20's budget, so what we're currently operating under, and the current FY21 projection and request. Uh, I've organized these for you to see the top 12 um, most expensive lines, essentially the ones that are the highest um, total cost for the school district. They go down all the way to like, you know, uh, $100 lines. But it's the delta that I'd like to draw your attention to for just a moment. So uh, two that are just the largest delta, um, and, and before we go into any further, I think it's important to note I know it's challenging to talk about deficit and how we close that, but I also want to make sure that this conversation is not placing blame on any one line item or any one program or any one set of services. At the same time, we just have to have an honest conversation about the numbers, right? So the two that do have the largest delta from FY20 to FY21 are private school tuition for out-of-district uh, special education services and our collaborative tuition for the same kinds of services. Um, the rest have what we consider to be projectable deltas, that is deltas that represent the colas, steps, lanes, projected costs, and so on that um, usually come year to year. Those two are substantially higher than what would be typical currently. Um, two other things, though, to keep in the back of your mind as you think about those lines. 
The first is that last year, our actuals for out-of-district expenses were greater than what we had estimated for costs as well. And so I've asked our team to budget really conservatively, right? So to um, be more conservative than we've been typically, so that we're not jammed up in a situation in which we have unanticipated costs showing up in the spring that jammed us up last year. Uh, we were certainly um, happy to be able to get that supplemental state budget to, to support us there. Lastly, you're probably wanting to know, well, tell us more about these two um, deltas and these two lines and, and a little bit about why that is. So I'm trying to just anticipate the questions. Here's the next drill down. So this represents uh, a drill down into those two lines. Again, you're looking at about $1.2, $1.3 million in delta from FY20 to FY21 in those lines alone. The first three um, rows that you see here are just the enrollments. So individual, again, student enrollment, just like I showed you in the first couple of pages. Enrollment drives the work that we do. The number of students we have drive the work that we do. This line here is just the total enrollment. So from projected FY21 to historical FY18. What's interesting and what I want to draw your attention to is the total number of students that we provide services to has actually gone down, uh, which is good for kids. It means we're keeping more kiddos here in our community, in our schools, uh, in our classrooms where appropriate. But the average tuition has gone up pretty dramatically. Um, and that's a function of two things, uh, typically a function of two things, and Diana and Paul can certainly share more with you. The first is just services for students. Um, uh, that tuition is a function of the kind of service that a kiddo might need. And we're a school district. Our job is to give kids whatever it is they need. In some cases, that might be expensive, but we do what's right by kids, even if it has an expensive cost to it. The second, though, is a little bit out of our hands, which is these institutions change their rates. And they have to get approval by the state, but they do change their rates, and those rates go up pretty dramatically. Um, and you can see just by the costs here. So know that um, that is a combination of the two. I want to be fair about it. But that's created a situation in which we've had a 60% increase in tuitions from 18 to 21. There are other changes to the budget for sure. Um, but in general, that is the crux of the challenge that we're currently facing. And I want to be frank with you about, about that. I want to share one or two last things and then maybe turn it over to Diane and Paul to offer some more context and some more, um, to more detail to it. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. I think Diana has said before that halfway through the year, schools can change their tuition as well. We just received a letter from two schools looking to change their tuition. This school, for next school year, for fiscal 21, 22, whatever. 21. 21. However, this school year, one school changed as of November 1st. Yeah. So retro. This year, no, effective like November. So effective November 1st, theirs went up, mm. which was not, we knew that they might go up, but if we didn't know by how much. Sorry. We didn't know by how much. Mm -hmm. um, so that one school is four students, four students whose tuitions went up as of November 1st. That was not obviously right. in our budget, right? And we budgeted the tuition that we had from Operations Services Division. So it went up this previous November 19th, they, st they raised the tuition? As of November 1st, they raised their of, tuition. No, of 2019. Of 2019. Okay. So the FY20 budget is right. immediately, yeah. and right. then the 21. And then the 21. Yeah. And then we are starting to receive letters from schools that are going to increase theirs for, for the FY21. But again, we have to wait now for the um, process to be finalized and then OSD to tell us, that's the Operations School Division, they then tell us what the next year's tuitions will be. I can only project on the current year's tuitions. Thanks. Now, I'll just share one other thing and then I want to pass it to, to Paul and Diana to share a little bit more with you. Uh, so again, I want to underscore that um, we have several options still at our, our fingertips to think about how we close that gap and that it also includes all of the other programs and services for our kids as well. So I think sometimes when we have conversations about out of district and about special education services, there can be this knee jerk reaction to place blame on um, students' disabilities, on the state of education in the way in which kids get their services. And I just uh, ask us to be considerate of the needs of every kid and our charge to help every kid get whatever it is they might need to meet their educational goals, um, even if that sometimes is maybe outside of, of our school district in cases. 
So I want to turn it over to Paul and Diana. They'll share a little bit more texture with you and then answer any questions you might have. So I have been looking at this for quite a bit uh, since last year when we, um, back probably April, May, June, July time frame, when we were looking at these costs going north rather than south um, in the same number of students. So we kind of recognize that this might be a structural situation and that we have to do something to try to stem that tide. And it doesn't look like even in fiscal year 21 that we're going to be able to do that because we have two things that are hitting us at once. We have less students because some of our students are graduating from this year, from fiscal year 20. They're going to graduate in June uh, our out of district placements. But we have some students that are not eligible for circuit breaker because they came in in January. So we have a couple of about four or five students that just are looking at that. They're in, they're in evaluations, right? Yeah, I can explain that. Yeah, and we also have a couple of really young students that are just turning, and now we have to take care of those students. So I'll let Diana. So that, that, that's what we're looking at. So as I said before, we have to meet a foundation first. And our foundation this year to meet is the 45793. Anything below that, circuit breaker won't cover. So we do have some students who've come to us that are, their tuitions are under that amount because of the time of year that they've started with us and calculating the days. We also um, don't receive any circuit breaker on any placements that we do that are just for assessments. So we make what we call a 45 day assessment period. We may send a student to the collaborative for that 45 days. I have to pay a tuition on that, but I'm not reimbursed by circuit breaker for that at all. So that's also in these costs. Um, next, for the FY21, or for FY22 circuit breaker, it goes up 9% to 48,450 of the foundation, is, becomes the foundation. So our tuitions keep raising and our foundation keeps raising and so it, it never, it really never helps. <laughs> and just to put it in, the, in perspective, if we have a $100,000 placement, the first $45,000 is the town of Situates. Then circuit breaker kicks in for 75% of the 55,000. So that 45,000, that's that's $40,000, I think, on 55 on 55,000, it's $45,000. So Situate has to pay $60,000 for that $100,000 placement, and we get circuit breaker the next year for that other $40,000. Also, Ron had mentioned budgeting conservatively. So each year when I budget, so for next year, I had budgeted a percentage increase of the tuitions. And I did that pretty high, you know, that I normally would, or that I even anticipate tuitions are going to go up so that there's a buffer, <laughs> right? But also, um, we have to do that with our circuit breaker. So you also mentioned circuit breaker refunds at 75%. I'm not going to budget a refund of 75% because more continuous, more consistently we've been at around 72%. This year we're lucky to get the 75%. So next year's budget is at 72% of foundation, not. So you have to take into consideration what these numbers really <laughs> reflect is a budget that is trying to anticipate everything. Can I ask you a question? How can you even predict tuition increases? I mean, the, just the school just determines that based on so the needs and how what do they I, know? So here's what I do. I take um, OSD, the Operations School Division, has pricing for every school except collaboratives. The collaboratives have their own list. Yeah. So I take that list of pricing. So let's say that it's $100,000 for a tuition for this year that we're in. And I increase it by 3%, 5% as a projection for FY21. 
I don't know what it's going to be next year. I don't know what OSD is going to tell us that it's going to be increased, and we won't know most likely till the summer when all of this is done. And so we try to make our best educated guess on history of increase. Um, and then you have the middle of the year OSD says you got a tuition increase now and like, oh, okay. And, you know, not that we didn't know that there wasn't going to come one, but we didn't know by how much. And sometimes it's a lot more. So the one school that did increase did increase a lot more than any buffer could have been. Can I just add something to that? Thank you. I just want to add one other caveat just to underscore. We got jammed up last year on this. We got jammed up last year on this a bit, right? We, um, our budgeting was sort of right down the line, right? Like we um, made budgets on special education numbers that we thought were the highest, most likely. But we got jammed up. We found that some of those that were unlikely ended up coming through. Uh, and so this number does represent a much more conservative approach, but the intention is so that this committee, this school district, doesn't find themselves in the spring after budgets voted having to go back and go, well, actually, the actuals are starting to come in and they, some of these less than likely scenarios have occurred and now we're jammed up by whatever it is, a few hundred thousand dollars. So I just want to underscore and, and, and recognize Diana's work to budget more, more conservatively on the special education numbers as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I always want to say that even though in doing this, you don't know. This is a fluid movement every day. When, they, when these guys ask me, is this your budget? I say, this is my budget today. Because they don't know what's going to happen three weeks from now, five families move in, and I've got five placements or whatever. Um, so I just want to make sure that as conservative as we can be, you, it, it's a fluid moving document every day. And budgets were due Thursday before Christmas. So everything was in Thursday before Christmas. We looked at it Friday. Um, I got sick last week. Diana was out. Um, uh, so. We looked at it today. Again, we know what our tuitions are going to be, but it's going to change. We've already looked at that already this morning, and we're looking at well, maybe this one can be tweaked a little bit more. We're hoping it's going to go down. But as it stands right now, based in on the information that we know and everything that we've seen so far, this is what we think we're going to have. We're hoping it's going to go down. But basically what we wanted to show you was the percentage increase in the same number of students, it looks to us like it's structural and it's, a lot of it is based on the needs of the child and not being able to service them here and service them at different places. Also too, as much as I have tuitions, some students mid-year um, will have a need for one-to-one -one paraprofessionals even in their placements. That's an additional cost. That's, you know, everything becomes a la carte above a tuition. Mm -hmm. um, so that did happen one year where nobody anticipated the student became very ill, physically needed a paraprofessional short term, but we ha that was above and beyond what we budgeted. So again, there's always something. Uh, uh, Diana, do you find that it's more the private day um, placements that raise the tuition mid-year versus the collaborative? Oh, absolutely. The collaboratives yeah. are, are very stable, and you have a committee. You can talk to the collaboratives, Ron, because you're on that committee, but th it's the day placements. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, they, they're, com they're a whole separate entity as to an agreement. It's mm -hmm. the OSD state pricing that does the day placement and does the, um, the residential placements. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really unfair um, for these private schools to do that to towns. To every, I mean, it's if you agree on a price, you should stick to it. <laughs> I mean, I understand you know things can happen like if you know like the situation you just explained, but yeah.
mean, is there a bigger conversation about this among your colleagues? Like, what is the, we cannot, Situa cannot be the Always. only town with this. <laughs> no, it's, it's, this is everywhere. This is not unique to Situate, and I meet monthly with my South Shore Special Ed Directors, um, Student Service Directors, and we all commiserate over all of this. Um, you know, you receive a letter from OSD saying that this school is, is um, requesting a pricing increase, and you can come to this meeting to say your piece, but it, you can say your piece, the vote's going to happen. It's, I don't know of any time in my, whatever, 15 years in Massachusetts anyway, that it's ever been no. You can imagine what the business managers are doing. And, and, and it's not, you know, we, we're numbers guys. And like Ron said earlier, um, you know, we don't want to, it's just the, the numbers and the dollars um, are rising. And it's, it's just the way it is, and it's, we have to educate these children, so. And I just want to uh, thank you both for just, again, uh, kudos to Diana and Paul. They've been working um, from home sick and with family uh, across, you know, the, the region on pulling this together for us. Um, I'll underscore two last things, and then I'll talk about some next steps. The first is we talked a lot about changes in pricing, and that has been substantial, but that's not the whole number here, right? This is just services for kids have changed, and while the number of kiddos that we, um, that require those services our district have gone down, and I think that's a testament to our special educators our classroom educators, uh, to Ms. Mullen and her team as well, the uh, amount and kind of service has increased and has increased pretty dramatically. Um, so I just want to offer a balanced perspective that it's not just a change in you know, private um, institution pricing, although that certainly contributes to it. So uh, the second thing I just want to underscore with you, if I can here, um, I'll go back up for just a moment. So I want to share with you some next steps um, for us to think about, you know, ultimately having to close that gap. We've got to find a way to close about 1.1 um, million in, currently in our projection and talk about something that Paul had mentioned. Uh, Paul had said, you know, this number is conservative and it certainly can change and hopefully can go down. Um, is it possible it goes up? Sure, of course it is. Um, and so our work over the next few weeks and months is going to be trying to really keep a tight eye on that number and, and those daily conversations we have in Diana's office about where we stand at this moment in time. Um, but also starting to think about, you know, what kinds of things we need to do to ensure that we have this resource to provide our students, um, which brings me to the next steps. Uh, the first is actually longer term, and I'm, I'm glad to see the committee meeting next week on uh, the superintendent search. Um, I would strongly encourage this community to pursue a special education stabilization fund. We're one of the few communities in the region that doesn't currently have one. Um, I'd like to try to move forward with it maybe this spring if the committee is open to, to something like that, and the community is as well. I know we've talked about it, I don't know, I've talked about it for about a year now, ever since we had an initial uh, fluctuation. Essentially what it does is it's like a bank account that you set aside some funds for a day where you get a spike in um, services that are a district, as an example. Um, it works just like any other stabilization fund for bridges and roads and those sorts of things as well. You don't know when you need a bridge and road, but when you do, you need a bridge and road. The same is true here for special education services. Um, I've already approached some of our colleagues in the town to start to explore this. I may not be able to get it in place for you f in the next couple of months, but would really strongly encourage this district and this committee to consider it, uh, if we can't get it for this upcoming fiscal year, for the future, I think it would be beneficial. That said, in the short term, um, the team and I will continue to work on a plan with a couple of options that we'll bring to the committee for the January 27th meeting. Um, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but I want to be really transparent with you. It's a pretty su substantial distance between the costs and the revenues. It, it's going to likely mean that some of those options, if not all those options, require in some level of reduction in force. And that's simply because we have 85% of our budget is staff. We can make reductions in that 15%, right, in stuff, um, but that's not going to close that gap, and nor do we want to have kids without the right equipment and the right supplies and the right materials as well. That's a really hard conversation to have, there's no doubt about it, um, but it's one that um, when you have it and you think about options, you think about options that keep kids at the center 
center of our work and then ultimately adhere to our core values and to our priorities as a school district as well as our contracts and all of our obligations. So we've reached out already to a number of other stakeholders um, who have you know, direct impact on this from our, our school leaders to our union representatives and leaders as well and to, to the board as well to give you a heads up about it. Um, we'll continue to do that work between now and the 27th and it'll be our expectation to share with the committee a balanced budget along with some options to ensure that budget is balanced. Again, I really prefer to have these meetings where I say, and here are the really cool new things that we've been talking about, and we've got five that we want to put in a recommended budget. It's certainly not, um, it's certainly not something that I, I relish to have to share with you, but I'd rather be sharing with you now in, in advance, right, early, early January, before um, we get into you know, the spring, we start to, to vote budgets. Uh, with that said, I'll certainly open up to the committee for any questions you might have. I just, first of all, I want to, I appreciate it. We don't want to focus on the, the issue at hand in terms of blaming this, the proper placements for our kids. But I just, the one, the one number I'm having a problem with is the, um, well, two, the 2020 revised budget. Where's the 2020 original budget? Oh, um. For the private school, uh, well, I guess, yeah, private school tuition. We have to pull that for you and, and send it your just, way. But it's on our it's, it's on our website. Yeah. I'm just trying to get to the delta of the 855, but that's comparing 2020 with 2021. Yeah. And yeah. to me, that not, that number is high only because that's just a, a big difference, and that's a difference of you know worst case probably four additional residential placements. It's it's the. $1.2 million dollars in circuit, it's the $1.2 million dollars in circuit breaker, so you're minusing that out, and you got 976 in 2021. So that's a $250,000 difference right there. Yeah. And then you got the increase for fiscal year 21 that Diana put up there for 300, 144 versus 4.1 that we're looking to spend this year in fiscal year 20. Versus there's 300, there's 550 thousand dollars I just identified right there, between those two numbers. See the 1.205 and the 976. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're when, when you're doing the private school, the, the revised budget, you're you're decreasing it by the expected or by the prior by the circuit, circuit breaker, breaker, and we haven't taken out the. There's some, uh, that's what Ron was talking about, the Delta, the $500,000 Delta. There's also some idea that I have to talk to Diana about, idea grant money that we can probably offset some more off of that we haven't taken out of here yet. And it was taken out in fiscal year 20. Paul's talking about these initial- Initial offsets, right, yeah. yeah. There's some things that we can do administratively that don't impact our educational program yeah. Again, just like oh. taking into account, oh sorry, yeah. they're taking into account like final numbers on um, retirements is a great example. Like in this number, there's something like a quarter of a million dollars in retirements, but it's only January, and so we have some of that number identified, but not all of that number identified. Same is true with like grant reappropriations. We don't have the IDEA federal numbers in yet. We have an expectation of what that federal number might be and what Diana's team can appropriate through that federal dollar amount. That money could go up. It's unlikely that goes up given the current trend in federal allocations for, special, uh, for um, education, but it certainly could. So this, as I mentioned at the outset, this number could change as well, and potentially for the better, but that is a conservative number that wouldn't go down. Right, but it, so okay. So in reality, that delta is a difference between additional placements and lesser amount of circuit breaker to cover those costs. Lesser revenue. It's a com it's a tough combination of in increased I mean, does it, would it be helpful? Revenue. In my mind, it would be helpful to separate I don't know if I can see it anywhere, but to see the circuit breaker number as one line item and then the actual tuition as a separate line. This is the circuit breaker right here. <clears throat> we could break that out. Right. Put it all of that. Yes. I just think it would help. Can I? It still, it still seems like a large number. That's all. That's all. I just, I know I have to process it, but it seems like a large number would have expected. That's all. It absolutely is. I'll just share one thing about that because I know this is an ongoing discussion that, that Paul and I have. Our the software system that operates our town, our region, which is a typical software system, uh, only includes um, 
the number that is the local number. And so in the budget that you see, that 30 page budget that I share with you, I purposely break out exactly that because I think the same way you do, which is like, uh, where's the revenue? Where are the costs? Now let me compare them. The software system requires us, like this is a pull right from Munis from the software system, requires us to back that number in and back that number out repeatedly, which is difficult. And that's what I think you're wrestling with here is like, where's my um, circuit breaker number? This is what we have to do on our own to pull out what Diana gets from Massachusetts, from the circuit breaker, and then Paul's got to bring it back into the budget when we uh, you know, push it through Muniz and ultimately through the town. But you will see in your final version on January 27th, Mr. Gates, that breakout as I do every year. Circuit breaker and so the, versus costs. The, the 2021 requested budget also includes the circuit breaker on this sheet. Includes on this sheet, it does. Includes the expected circuit breaker reimbursement. You got it. Yeah. And on the final budget, I always break those out just so we can have a separate conversation if needed about here's the cost, here's the actual circuit breaker coming in. And the same is true with all the other revenue sources as well. All the federal grants, I do that with all the fees, even though it would be nice to not have to charge any fees at all, I break all those out for you so you can see those itemized rather than built in to something. Other questions, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, Diane, I have a couple of quick, quick questions for you. Sure. Uh, of the 46 students that are out of district for next year, do we have a cohort that we could bring back and create a program that would yeah, so I be always, smaller than the cost? I'm always looking at that. And, and you'll, you saw um, Ron had put up what we were looking at for, um, yes, this. And we're looking, we're hopefully discussing moving the, um, the GEMS program, our elementary therapeutic program, into middle school because we have students now from that program that are going to go to middle school and there's no program for them. So they would potentially be a placement if we don't have something. For students that are out, I, I always look at that, but to be quite honest, the students that are out, we really aren't able to meet their needs. A program would be more expensive than the placement at this point for, for the type of student that we have in out of district. We're always talking about that with families. We never have out of district be the end for a student. We want to always bring someone back. Um, but to be quite honest, Situate has every, almost every possible program we can have. It's now making sure we have a continuum to remain, to keep those students with us. Um, we've really built our program significantly here and, um, and we meet the needs of so many students. So I'm not sure that there's a new, another new program for us to, to um, develop at this time, uh, but we always are looking at that. Okay. Are other towns in the area looking to say, okay, if I'm making things up, like if Hingham did this mm -hmm. kind of program and Situate did this kind of program, that it would actually benefit the area? I mean, one of the concerns yeah. is you don't want to take a kid and say, okay, you got to go to the North Shore every day for right. the you know, residential place, because it's the only place in the area that helps you. Yep. So um, we do tuition in other students to our current programs. <laughs> and uh, just received two more referral packets from other districts and three more hopefully coming in for some of our programs, so that's great. And does help keep students more local and able to participate in their own school activities after schools, so they're not in the traveling and all of that. One year we did try to work with Norwell uh, when we first initiated the language-based program at the elementary school for us, and they were doing for a middle school, and we were trying to just share students it didn't work out as well as we had hoped, and that's why we now have a language aids program in our middle school. Um, so we really attract other districts to the programs we've developed. Um, and we actually had another school district come and just visit because they want to start something up. So they said, you've done it, can you teach us? Mm -hmm. So we're, I think we're kind of trailblazing, if you will, with program development. So. Okay, and that makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Ron, I guess this question is for you, but I mean, if this is, you know, rough numbers, 12% of our budget, staff is 85% of our budget, I mean, we just ate our budget. We still gotta keep the lights on, we gotta buy books, we have to buy paper and pencils. Right. I mean, is there anything we can do through the state or through the town to say, hey, look, you know, can we take a little bit more from free cash? I mean, I know we get two thirds of the town budget, it's a lot, but at the same time, I mean, you look at the list that you just had up, I mean, like, quick math, I found $350,000 that we need 
in every year it's like well we have all these things we want to put in to the classrooms and there's so much more that we we want to do but we have to say no i mean is there something we can do the short answer is we've already started exploring that i don't have anything firm for the committee yet um, but as soon as we got these numbers that was one of the first items that we started to take a look at i don't want to get out ahead of ourselves on what those options might be but we'll certainly have those options available for the committee and, and different variations like if this came to fruition we would do this if this came to fruition we could do this instead we'll have those for the 27th okay thank you oh yeah sure uh, with the way that our numbers have increased, this will, uh, I, in February, I will apply for circuit breaker extraordinary relief. I don't know if we will get it because you have to meet a certain threshold for that as well, but it gets us ahead on understanding what our actuals are going to be even if we don't get extraordinary relief. So um, I've done that once, one other time here and we did receive significant funds and you get it now. It's not in arrear, so it's to help you in this fiscal year. So um, I'll be doing that again in February. Okay. And just generally, in terms of you know total number of out of districts and total tuition in our area, are we high versus like Norwell and Hingham, or are we in the middle? Like we're how, more how we middle high, I would say. We're middle high. I'm always looking at that number, and I'm happy to see it going down. And I want to keep continuing to make that number go down. Um, but I really feel like, as I said before when you asked the other question, I feel that the students that are in placements really need those placements. Um, so. And, and I completely agree with Ron's statement before that, I mean, every kid deserves the best education possible. I'm not trying to take a dime out of any no, of these no, out of district right. placements, but at the same time, it's, you know, there's a whole district we have to look at and Absolutely. just what we can do for ourselves to make it better, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Just yep. For maybe 30 seconds, if I can, um, uh, there would be a moment. I apologize for this uh, thing being smaller. Hang on one. This is, um, oh, thanks, man. So this is our draft budget. Again, we start working on this months in advance. And this is your per pupil spending for Situate. This is for 2018-19 uh, as a sidebar. DESE doesn't have data any more up to date than this. So this is the very most up to date data that you'll eventually see in the 20. 7th, 29th, whatever that, that meeting is. Uh, this is your per pupil right here, which is 15,000 per child. Again, total enrollment, this was 2019. But the thing I want to share with you is the percentage of students with disability is at 14%. And you can take a look at this. Uh, there's a software system that DESE has called Radar, where I can uh, look at our district compared to literally any of the 351 other districts in the Commonwealth and compare an infinite number of factors, including funding and resources and uh, ratios of teachers, et cetera. But uh, our percentage of children that have special needs, that have disabilities, are well within the median of our region, and in some cases lower. But I go back to that total amount, the average tuition for the kiddos that do have those significant needs that that has increased quite dramatically. So if that answers your question, Mike, just a little bit more about like where we stand in terms of um, our region. Okay, thank you. Any questions for me? Uh, no, I don't have any. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, next up is the second opportunity for comments, statements, questions from the public. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Um, Josephine Hanley. And I have a question that relates to the SOI and to the budget, but it's really a follow-up on a concern that I've been raising all year. Um, and it relates to Hatherley and Cushing and the safety of the students and the staff there. So um, when we started the SOI, uh, it was noted in one of the meetings that one of the reasons that we have to go this route is the cost of retrofitting those schools. To, to comply with safety and so on. And it was noted that there's no fire suppression system in those schools. So I've spent the past year trying to determine for Cushing, what do we have in place? And there's two issues here. The first issue, and I think the most troubling perhaps was the transparency, <laughs> because you know we had assurances that there were no concerns. And this was uh, in relation to um, fire detection, and it was related to an issue about doors and preparedness and so on, but <clears throat> we were assured there weren't issues, that we were in good shape, and we're not. 
Um, there was subsequently a request for $50,000 submitted by the fire department to put in what is actually needed. Um, my understanding is that there are um, there's a significant lack of both fire detection and carbon monoxide detection. Um, so, and I see you're bringing up a proposal there, Ron, but so it's taken me a year to get any sort of recognition that we do have a problem. And, you know, I've written a number of emails about it, so I think the liability at this point for the town is probably increasing. But, you know, the first issue is we have to make sure that the students and the staff are safe. Currently, they are not. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I think, you know, given now that we, are, we have a setback with the SOI, it might be prudent to do a safety audit for at least Cushing and Hatherley and determine where we do have significant risk to the health and safety of the students and staff. Um, and not only would that give the parents some peace of mind, because I think right now there is a lack of confidence when we hear that, you know, that, that everything is as it should be, given what we discovered with the fire detection, I think there is a distinct lack of confidence, at least among the parents that I've spoken to. The second thing I think that would do is perhaps bolster our next SOI, because I think if we were transparent about the degree to which we are not in compliance, and I know we're grandfathered in, so technically we're not in violation of the law, but if your child is sitting in a classroom or someone you know, is, is teaching in that classroom and there is no fire detection and no smoke or no carbon monoxide detector, we know carbon monoxide is a silent killer. So a fire, somebody might notice it, pull the alarm to, to trigger it and so on, but, but there is significant risk with being out of compliance on these things. And so if we could, through an audit, bring peace of mind to the parents and staff, and at the same time bolster the SOI, I think that would be, that would be good. So that's one thing I'd like to propose. And the second thing I'd like to know is what is the status of the request by the fire department to make the improvements at Cushing? Part of our facilities and capital plan that you see here, the proposals by the school department um, in, in coordination with our colleagues in the fire department, it will go to the town for the annual town meeting. Uh, in terms of bolstering our SOI, it, it, and more information can always help, sure. Um, and MSPA showed up to our buildings and walked them themselves, so they are very aware of the state of the buildings. Um, that information regarding the safety equipment, regarding all of the detection equipment, is already part of Habib's analysis. Um, it'd, be the, it'd, be the, it'd be the wills of the committee if they want to um, allocate resources to do further audits. That's certainly something that they can do. Uh, but in my uh, opinion, that that wouldn't bolster your uh, SOI any further. But let me ask you then, just with respect to that point, are you saying that there was greater transparency given to the people who did that walkthrough and to the parents who were requesting that information? No, I, I would just have to disagree with you. Well, that was a question, not a statement. <laughs> Yeah, I would disagree with your, your question because it feels like it's an assertion that there was some kind of... Um, Non-transparent. Yeah, I just don't think that's accurate. The, there are two systems at the Hadley School. Uh, Chief and I talk every time those emails go back and forth about what those systems are because he is certainly the expert in those things. Um, this is certainly an upgrade for sure, and I think it's a, a good use of the resources of our town. Um, but I would disagree in a question or an assertion that implies some limited amount of transparency in the systems that exist in our schools. We're assured in a public meeting, um, and you know, some other people in the room were in that, in that public meeting, that when the fire chief did a walkthrough of Cushing, that he didn't make the principal aware of any issues with the alarms. They do a walkthrough every single year, and they approve all of the safety equipment that are in all of our schools. They do it every summer. 
And again, I agree with you, we should absolutely be upgrading uh, a variety of systems for our schools. Those are our two oldest schools. There's a litany of things that we should absolutely be trying to upgrade. Um, the reason we go with the SOI approach is it's a more comprehensive approach, right? You have a new building, and that new building has all of the newest fire suppression, all of the newest um, doors and windows and locks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because you don't have that opportunity at this moment, you'll want to do a piecemeal approach with items like this and certainly other items. Um, could you do an audit to identify items? You certainly could. Could you lean on the existing uh, analysis that's already been done? I think you could do that as well. Um, would that change your status of your SOI? My opinion is it would not. Okay, so to the school committee, then, given, and I know I've contacted each of you, um, given what we've seen this year of the questions back and forth and where we're at and the fact that there is this need. Um, what is your sense of how safe the students and staff currently are and if there were to be an incident? And what is the um, plan to fast track this? Or is there I can speak to how the emails that we, you know, we sent to each other and included in that was from the deputy chief that he stated that the you know, there aren't any safety issues, so to speak, with regards to, he had complete confidence that the, the kids in the schools are not in danger. And, you know, the, like Mr. Griffin said, they, the chief goes to, they do a walkthrough of all the schools. And I can't imagine that if there were any signs of the kids being in imminent danger, that they would let that go by. But there are no carbon monoxide detectors or smoke detectors I believe the library, the most paper intensive of the rooms. He's, he said, stated that there were no hardwired carbon monoxide detectors. And I think those type are different than the stand, the wireless card. My understanding is that they aren't there, that, that there is no detection card. My statement is simply this, again, I feel like we're not experts in fire suppression or detection or any of those things, and I would say that probably none of us in the room are experts in any of those things, so we have to lean on our experts. And our experts recommend this as um, an interim solution for the next few years, hopefully, when the school can be <coughs> built new. Um, I, I, I feel that back and forth around what we think is the right fire detection, suppression, identification systems um, is, isn't the right group to be making those ultimate recommendations. Well, again, with respect, that's not really the question. I'm not asking for your expertise on fire safety, but I was asking you to lean on the back and forth that we have seen, and of which I can make public the documentation. But right now, given that the fire department feels that it would be wise to spend this money, bring them up to some level of safety, what is, what is the timeline for getting this into place? It's on the, um, it, it's due to be voted on at town meeting. I mean, if the, if the chief or the deputy chief felt that this should be fast-tracked, they absolutely would say that. They would go to the town and we would get this done, taken care of. But if, if there was some urgency to it, we would know. As far as the, from the fire department's point of view, I, I mean, I'll reach out to the chief. I can speak to him about it. But and I can, I, from the email that the deputy chief sent to you, it, he seemed comfortable with the process that we're going through. And he felt confident that the kids aren't in any danger. And they're the experts. And they, have, they live in this town, they have kids in this town, and they certainly would not put any of the kids in the school system at risk. Okay, but you need this, in the experts' mm -hmm. opinion, we do need to spend 50000 to to put these detection systems on where they are not currently. So we're not fast-tracking this as well. There's no fast track capability that this body has, so that we've gone through the appropriate process with facilities and capital. It's been approved by this body. It's been approved by the capital um, planning uh, board as well. It's outside of the locus of control of this body to fast track a project. It's not the resource um, that's under the auspice of the school department or the school committee. So um, just like I talked about sped stabilization, those sorts of things, that's the legislature, the, in this case the town, has to decide whether or not they want to appropriate funds to cover a cost. Okay, so we're, we're, everybody here is comfortable that in the event 
of a carbon monoxide or fire incident? Or the mm -hmm. hearing? Paul, can you clarify for us? I'm sorry. Can you clarify for us just for Cushing and Hadley specifically, if possible, what we have currently? We have fire. And where? We have um, outside of the um, boiler rooms. There are carbon monoxide um, in those areas where the the carbon monoxide we generate. generate from. We have a hot water system in each one of the classrooms. So. Is hot water there in the radiators or the the systems the, that are in each one of the classrooms? There's not much carbon so monoxide the, coming from hot water. So the carbon monoxide detectors are placed where the, the, the fire department is, where everything emanate, where the fire department told us to put them. And in terms of the fire alarms and we have smoke detectors. Okay. Yes. They told us where to put some of them. We don't have enough. Obviously, they want us to put some more. They want some more, but they have. We have what we have available where they told us to put them, and we put them up. There's a battery operated in there around. These ones are wireless. This is what they're looking for for the next couple of years, and it's portable. We can move it. Right, and in terms of. Of, uh, of finding the funds to do this, it would not come out of, as Mr. Griffin said, it would not come out of our budget. It's a capital item request that goes through the process. I don't know. It there's a process that goes. Already went through. The, so there's two two groups that have to approve it. Back to more capital planning and advisory committee. They would need to approve this, and then we'll go to town meeting. And if approved, then then it would then it, the process would be completed. But that is the process. Is there anybody We do, yeah. We have Representative Nicole is on the is on the Capital Planning Committee, and then Superintendent and Mr. Mm -hmm. Donlin the three um, of us proposed to Capital Plan and Advisory, and then also the Town Administrator would would make the recommendation. And then it goes before a Town Meeting. That's the process. But and, and just to wrap up, I would urge the School Committee to consider the safety audit because Nicole, you know, it was difficult to get information. Um, as to where, where we were on this. So, you know, we don't know what else is out there. And speaking as a parent, and on behalf of the parents that have raised concerns to me through the parents' perspective as well, we need to know. We need to know that the kids are going from home. Yep, and I think this also ties into the conversations about the doors and the safety and the locks. And can we just get a, another clarification on all of the locks or upgraded that was a project that was completed i think it was like in the final upgrade and that yeah. i think at the last meeting ago, paul right? updated us yeah. on that all the locks are done all yes every building yes that was mr griffin's directive they're done what do you mean by every building cushing and hallerly <laughs> have right. locking have the correct yes. doors for safety oh no they have locks Correct locks on the doors for current safety protocol for emergency purposes. Up to date. Up to date. It's Every door. And with the, the doors we have. The yes. doors are still the same doors. Doors are still, still the same, same doors same. with the new fittings that meet yeah. current safety guidelines. Yes. Every door. Every door. Every classroom door. Can you? I'm sorry, can you just state your name and your address, please? And I brought up a town meeting um, last year that you can't, look, you could not lock the doors at Cushing if you were a substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. You had to have someone, and that's what she Right, and I think that's what Mr. Donlin just said. Yes. Yes. That's so yes. Done. Yes. Okay. I have another comment if we're done. Yes. <laughs> is this the appropriate time to talk about? Yes, it is the time. Uh, before you before you go on, I, I want to ask two questions on this topic. Then I'll okay. Um, do, for the the fire chief's report, do we have a physical report that we can put on the website, or is it already available somewhere for the public? The, the fire chief's report. You said when they do the walkthrough every summer. Oh, they they do the walkthrough. It's just a safety walkthrough. So they go through, they check all the equipment and materials, to make sure that um, the the percentage of paper on the walls is the right percentage of paper on the walls. It's just a pass fail for us, and it okay. doesn't fail. So there's no written report that says this 
you know, passes, this barely passes, whatever. No, they send us a like, you can't open school until, okay. and then we have to get that squared away, whatever that might be. The exit yeah. signs, you know, yeah. okay. the ball's missing from the exit sign, right. you gotta get that fixed. Okay. And then if what they do. And then if we went down the road of doing a, a, an outside safety audit report, would that fall under our budget, or would that be something that the town would pay for? Your budget. substitute teachers and I've sent you all emails about um, the ongoing issue of the poor pay that's um, been happening since I started in 2001. I'm making exactly the same amount of money. I don't make minimum wage. I just about have a master's degree. So we approached the superintendent. He's worked with us and he came up with a plan which we think is wonderful of raising the day rate for substitute teachers. And it's wonderful, but I just wanted to see and make sure that you have in mind how the minimum wage is going to be raised over the next few years in Massachusetts to $15 an hour in 2023. And I'm hoping that you will put it in your plan to also incrementally raise that rate so a substitute teacher will at least be always getting minimum wage. Uh, I want to just say that I agree. Your concerns that you presented, that you uh, emailed to me, I right. agree wholeheartedly um, that there are concerns and we would like to address them. Um, it's something we can work on, um, but with the budget that was just presented, it might be kind of difficult, unfortunately. Well, he, he was including it um, going up to 95 days. Part of the, the items that we wanted to add to our budget, there yeah. costs roughly about forty thousand dollars when it's all said and done. That's the one that you and I took a look at you know, a month or so ago. Like this is what we could potentially propose. It's there. I want to These are the wants. I want to underscore yeah. Ms. Limblom's perspective. Um, if the budget were in a better place, I think it'd be an easy uh, solution. Right. It's not in a great place right now, and I would um, I would caution. Uh, adding any new expenses, despite the fact that I agree with you that our substitutes should definitely get paid more, um, and that those competitive rates would benefit all of our kids and our subs ultimately, it would be an additional cost, uh, and that would be challenging given the current uh, projections right now. So I want to be honest with you about that. Well, I'm wondering, when, at what point do you go to the town and say, mm -hmm. um, we need to increase our budget? What's happening is something that everyone in this room at this table knows about, and I haven't shared it with the rest of the town because I'm trying to be a good little Indian. But because you don't have substitute teachers at the schools, the paraprofessionals are pulled from the kids, students with special needs, and they are teaching in the classroom. And anyone who says that's not going on on a daily, weekly basis is not being um, truthful because I've spoken to uh, paraprofessionals, building principals, former secretaries. It's something that's been going on in our system and I'm sure other towns as well, forever. I've been there and I watched kids' paras be pulled to go teach third grade. And then those kids are not serviced. They're not meeting the mandate. Those kids, unless they go home and tell their parents, hey, by the way, Mrs. Mrs. P didn't teach me today, that parent doesn't know that their kid wasn't serviced because you don't have substitute teachers because you pay them ten seventy one an hour to come in and read a lesson plan and teach exactly what that teacher was going to teach that day with 15 minutes notice. Some days I would be called after school would start. They would call me and say, can you come in? We don't have anybody in kindergarten. I would get in there and, you know, I've got a classroom full of kids and I'm trying to read a lesson plan, and you know, if I wasn't there, a para would be pulled from another student to teach that class. It's happening. It happens at Cushing, it happens at Havily. Havily's MO is they just announced that Mrs. A is not in the building today. And that's code for don't send anyone out for math because, and no one's coming in for math because she's teaching second grade. And this is something that's been going on, and the children, the parents of the kids with special needs don't know it because people like me haven't spoken up. 
They're not going to self-report at the school level. That's why I wrote that big, long email. And my girlfriend, Lisa, and I have been trying to work with the superintendent quietly to get it done. Well, now I'm seeing that you guys are saying, I know, one kid can move into the district in August. Your whole budget is, um, budget is blown because you might have to have a placement outside. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. It's very unpredictable. But at some point, you have to say, just because the state allows us not to pay, um, you know, student uh, substitute teachers minimum wage, it's not necessarily the right thing to do because it's a domino effect. I haven't worked all year. Lisa isn't working either. We're working somewhere else together that pays us better. Now, her phone's always ringing off the hook for um, teaching at Gates. So I know she's not going. That means Gates isn't always having places filled. A girl, a friend of mine who teaches at Gates, her mother passed away, and she told me she had a different person in the building teach her class every single period of the day until my friend Lisa went in and taught it for two days straight. So what kind of education are these kids getting when a different person is pulled from Gates every period to go teach? They have minutes to look at a lesson plan. They might be a music teacher, and it's their break. You're paying them extra to go teach, you know, seventh grade English because there's no one in the building. I, it, I hear all of your concerns, and I agree with your concerns. Our hands are kind of tied at the moment because of the, the situation with the budget. And when I first heard that there was going to be a deficit, I asked one of the first things I thought of was, great, now we can't fix the substitute issue, the substitute well, teacher problem. Why do you go to the town? Why do you have to mm -hmm. say, okay, this is the finite amount of money that mm -hmm. we have to deal with? Why, we've done overrides. I've helped run the override for mm -hmm. Gates, for uh, Jenkins, why it's there now. I was involved with every phone call that had to be made two times over and then to get the operational budget after it sat empty. So there are times when we go, you, I would help you. I would get other people to help you. You need to go to the town and say, okay, this isn't right. We're, we're not paying these substitute teachers. I mean, I can go back at the grocery store and make more money an hour than I can subbing teaching third grade. And I teach exactly what the teacher was going to teach that day. There's no difference in the lesson plan. There's no sub plan. It's whatever she was going to teach on Wednesday. So I feel like at some point you have to say, OK, we, our hands are tied. You, you, you know, you can't pull a rabbit out of a hat. But you can go back to the town and say, you know what? This is right. We should be paying substitute teachers minimum wage. I can bag down at Village College. And, you're not, and the reason why you don't have subs is because of it. And when you don't have a sub, a kid is not getting serviced in special needs mm -hmm. because that's who they pull from. They don't let a first grade class go all day. They pull someone from within the building. Okay, I, I thank you so much for your comments. Right. And <laughs> I'm done, but I just want you to know, mm -hmm. you don't have to be alone. You don't have to deal with this finite mm -hmm. amount of money. We can go to the town and say, hey, mm -hmm. this is a problem. This should be fixed, yeah. right? right? Are you with me? <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Peter, expect great things. I know Michael Hayes is totally on my side. I'm <laughs> trying to get this done for you. I know he is. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to go to the town. All right. Any other questions or comments? No. All right. Moving on. Warren signatures? Yeah. Um, Peter uh, in for the school committee signed a warrant for $171,582.58. Um, is there any questions on that? It tells you exactly what there was. Yeah. Any no, I don't have any questions. Anybody have any? We just have to read it in two minutes. Okay. That's it. Is it written? That's it. That's Sorry. it. Okay. Yeah. Next up, the correspondence. I think there was one item. Um, anybody have any comments on the She's correspondence? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and other business? Anybody have any other business? Uh, just want to mention that um, 
due to my uh, affiliation with Wells Fargo, um, Paul, Ron, and I briefly communicated today about there's a uh, conflict of interest disclosure, potential conflict of interest, interest disclosure that I believe I'm going to file with the town that will just, um, I guess, recuse me or avoid any co potential conflicts of interest, I guess. Appearance. Appearance. So the, the bus lease, I always abstain from that vote, but there, apparently there's no. Now there's a copier yeah. uh, lease <laughs> that's part of going to be part of regular monthly warrants, and if I sign those, it could appear to be a conflict. So just by disclosing them, <laughs> I have nothing to do with Wells Fargo. <laughs> nothing. I had zero. Um, I don't even really work for Wells Fargo. Just it's kind of I don't know, but I'm related to them, so I'm going to just better to be okay. safe than sorry. Yeah. The other option is which isn't necessary, I don't think, right now, is someone else could be the secondary signer. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's not a big deal. I, I should, should be, I'd probably feel most comfortable having it on file anyways. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I think it just stays there until I'm yep. done. You file it annually, or if any yeah. of your conditions changed. And it's, okay. it's typical to file. So okay. Okay. We so take, it's, we can take turns. It's not a big deal, I think, but I have had to sign two things in the last couple yeah, of months. Yeah, you have. That's about it, right? It's just in Mike's. Mike typically will sign it. But they'll be in He's this. The they'll one. be in the regular ones too. So I might as well have myself covered if I sign that. Yeah, so. that's true. You could do that too. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Um, I think I'm. You said there might be a sick leave bank at the next, the 27th? Potentially. Still working on it. All right. Can we just coordinate the timing? So. <laughs> Closer. Closer. Yes. Yeah, since yes. it takes Depending about. Depending on the volume of staff. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and yeah. now I guess we'll enter executive session. I need a um, motion to enter. Ex oh, I'm sorry. On, the, on the, these yeah. notes, the minutes, it says you will reconvene yep. after. So we're, we're staying then? Um, nope, you don't have to stay. You don't have yeah. to stay. You don't have to stay. They just have to make. A, they have to have an executive session and then vote it in public session. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> you. Well, because yeah. I'm used to seeing it will not reconvene. Right. So that's <laughs> why I was asking. Sorry. Sorry. No, it's okay. All right. Do I hear a motion? Uh, move to executive session uh, to conduct contract negotiations for non-union personnel uh, with the intention to reconvene in open session after executive session. I have a second. Roll call. Do the roll call. Uh, Lynn Blom, yes. Gates, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we could like this. Oh. <laughs>